uh, now one o'clock. So ready when you are, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is 1 p.m. March 18, 2021. It's time for me to call to order the regular meeting of the Rancho Orange City Council, the Library and Observatory Board, the Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the redevelopment successor agency. Isaiah, would you lead us in the five school please? Certainly, I'm gonna ask Kofi Antebaum, our Director of Administrative Services to lead us today. Kofi? Great. of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, whatever, just for all. Thank you very much. Christy, would you give us a roll call, please? Councilmember Kite? Present. Councilmember Smotrich? Here. Councilmember Townsend? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Here. Mayor Hobart. Here. Isaiah, do you have a presentation for us? We do. Uh, we are honored today to have uh, Commission Chair Mary Lou Souter uh, to present to us on the upcoming Emergency Preparedness Commission webinar. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you for being here. Oh, how nice to be here and to see everyone. And I wish these five would be here as well. It just makes me yearn for former times when we were all together um, in this room. It's, uh, once this pandemic does ease down, it will be such a wonderful occasion. I'm really looking forward to it. So I'm here today to talk about a special a town hall forum we have coming up. And I believe we have a slide to show regarding that. Uh, this will be on, mark your calendars, Thursday, March 25th, a week from today. So at seven o'clock in the evening, uh, it will be a webinar, so it's a Zoom presentation. So you can watch and listen and participate in the whole presentation from your homes. Uh, the title of the presentation is Listen and Learn, More Secrets to Survive the Big One. So this will involve presentations from the Earthquake Country Alliance, from Home Depot uh, here in Rancho Mirage, from the American Red Cross, and also from the California Earthquake Authority. The uh, folks who, coming, who will be coming to do the presentation include experts in the field. Uh, we're talking about Mark Benthian. He's the chief executive officer at the uh, California Earthquake Alliance in Los Angeles. And he will be talking about uh, really all kinds of steps to uh, prepare for and survive and, and recover from earthquakes. Um, he just celebrated, I believe, 25 years uh, working in this field. Um, they celebrated his uh, 25th anniversary with him. Quite a remarkable young man. A young man. He's a, a direct uh, student of uh, the late Dennis Malati. So he was uh, trained and mentored by Dennis. So he's quite, quite an interesting young man. Of course, to me, most men are young men, so. <laughs> um, from Home Depot, we'll have Amanda Wilson. She's the assistant manager here at our local Home Depot. We thought, we thought as our commission, we thought, we, we asked people to do all these things about home preparedness but we never really tell them how or what to do. So we said, well, we have Home Depot right here in local Rancho Mirage, one of our businesses. So we invited them to come and show us some of the little Chotsky's things they have to secure your cabinets and to different things in your home to help protect you uh, if an earthquake does occur. Uh, so uh, Amanda Wilson will be here to do that. We have a representative from the American Red Cross coming in and that's Corey Ahola, and he's their interesting a senior volunteer recruiter. And I wanted him especially to come because Corey uh, has been doing, working with volunteers for years and years and years. And I've learned over the years that so many people who are involved in emergency management 
uh, have volunteered at some point in their lives for the American Red Cross. There's no better way to learn than by doing. So he will talk to us a little bit about the Red Cross and the uh, various services that they offer that they could provide to us in case of a disaster. And lastly, from Sacramento, we have California Earthquake Authority. Uh, they're known for their earthquake insurance, but they actually do a whole lot more than provide insurance. We have their uh, Janielle Maffey, who's their chief mitigation officer. And not only insurance, which you'll be also talking about minimizing loss to your home, how you can retrofit your home if it needs it. And we're talking about the concept of resilience uh, in a community and in a whole valley, uh, how we can all become more resilient. So again, if you mark your calendars, uh, that this is March 25th, one week from today, 7 p.m. It should last till about 8.30. We will have question and answer session toward the end, so you will be able to type in your questions and get them answered from the experts themselves. So we ask that you join us to, to uh, register for the event. Go to the uh, uh, address listed at the bottom of the slide. If you could, could you put the slide up one more time, please, for folks to get a look at it? And actually, you can go to the uh, Ranch Mirage uh, Emergency Preparedness Commission website uh, for more information. And that's easier. That's RanchoMiragePreparedness.org. Again, all one word, RanchoMiragePreparedness.org. I hope to see everyone virtually, at least, uh, a week from today. And I thank you all for this opportunity. I think we'll learn an awful lot and be a lot safer with this presentation. Thank you kindly, I appreciate your help. Thank you, Mary Lou. Welcome. Very much. Okay, we'll uh, now move to non-agenda public comments. And uh, again, Isaiah, would you take that over? Certainly, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we are now moving on to non-agenda public comments. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to speak on issues that are not on today's agenda for a maximum of three minutes per speaker. If you are participating remotely and you would like to make a non-agenda public comment, now is the time to do so. If you are on Zoom, you would hit the raise hand button. If you are participating by phone, you would hit star nine to make a non-agenda public comment at this time. Before we go to our remote audience, uh, we will go to the audience here in person. Uh, the first speaker is Wally Melendez. Uh, good afternoon, City Council of <clears throat> Rancho Mirage. And good afternoon to the, um, we, the people. And good afternoon to all the staff that works at this uh, <clears throat> administration building. So, now we're getting the shots. And I'm happy to tell you that I already took the first one. And to, uh, day after tomorrow, Saturday, I go for my second one. So, I'm happy to tell you. So, I wrote on the card that my subject is education, like always. And like everybody says, higher, higher education. And I know you all know, and in case you don't know, when most of the people come out of high school, they're just kids, little kids. They don't understand about the real life. So, I'm, you're seeing an example of 
a guy that has been educating himself all his life. And I just turned 76. And I'm missing the course that I was going to take last year because of that idiot in the White House. <clears throat> so, so my main point today is what you all have heard many times about a police state. Well, today, I'm referring to a police campus. So what I'm realizing when I start going to COD, I've been living in this area for four years, so what I realized about COD here, which is the, the community college, which I hate the word community, the college of the desert of the Cahuila Valley. And what am I noticing? It's a police campus. So I'm running for college trustee and that gang over there with their police looking cars are out of here. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there anyone else here in person that would like to make a non-agenda public comment? Okay, seeing no one else uh, here in person, let's go to our remote audience. Uh, the first speaker will be McCune Cameron. Hello, can you hear me or? Yes, we can, go ahead. Uh, please state your name for the record. My name is uh, Cameron McCune. Uh, I've been a resident of Rancho Mirage for approximately 15 years. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was a superintendent of schools in Fullerton, California. And uh, the two issues that I wanted to address today, one has to do with the time that the council is meeting. Uh, one o'clock is a great time for those of us that are retired. But if we're trying to incorporate the opinion of the working people in our city, that's not really a great time for them to, to be able to participate. And I think in this era of trying to get more participation, uh, I think it would go a long ways to have your meetings at a time that's conducive for people that uh, are still working, even if they're working remotely at home. And the other issue that I wanted to address has to do with uh, when we hold our elections. I'm not sure, I guess I would like to be enlightened as to why we have Rancho uh, Mirage elections uh, out of the cycle of the state and other ones that go on, other than that it costs us extra money to have a special election. I don't see any benefit to that. And uh, I would like to urge the council to consider aligning their elections with uh, the state so that it's more convenient for the community to uh, vote and participate in that way also. So those are the two issues uh, that I wanted to bring to your attention and hopefully you give them some consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The uh, next speaker is just identified as Randy. If you could please state your name for the record. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Randy Filish and I am the Southern California volunteer representative for Project Coyote, and I'm also a district leader volunteer for the Humane Society United States. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Hobart, uh, City Council members Kite, Weil, Townsend, and um, Ms. Smutrick. As a Rancho Mirage homeowner, I'm grateful for your service and the beautiful city that you protect. As written in my letter to you on March 5th, I too was shocked and saddened at the video uh, which went on YouTube, which showed reckless, unsafe, irresponsible, and truthfully cruel and inhumane shootings of our local Rancho Mirage wildlife at the S Golf Pond. The shooting that took place on March 4th included our local ducks and migratory birds, uh, the American coots. The video clearly shows the ducks being shot, and sadly, they're struggling in the water with one wing shot off 
and desperately trying to stay afloat and stay alive. Shame on us, right? Records indicate that this was a Rancho Mirage city approved and US Fish and Wildlife permitted shoot. But just because it's legal does not mean it is right or should be allowed. These types of permits should be suspended due to the unsafe and irresponsible way in which it was conducted. These shooters took no safety precautions for these bystanders and appear to be shooting for recreational and sports purposes. For the 3,000 people that have already seen this video, it appears that this is a weekly Thursday morning get together for these men, not about depredation or conservation as the permit requested. It also appears that the requirements of the permits were not followed. They are supposed to attempt non-lethal control first. Witnesses who were on the scene said that they did not. They are supposed to call the sheriffs before and after. Did they? Did the city or animal control ever investigate this? Or did Riverside County Sheriff's Department ever look into this? You as a city can stop these shootings so that this will never happen again in our beautiful city. While relieved that the S immediately stopped their plans for these shootings after receiving about 20,000 complaints, there is no reason for these dangerous shootings when there are many non-lethal methods available that can be used, including scarecrows, mylar balloons, fake predators, remote controlled boats, flashing lights, and bird alarms. As a last resort, they could even bring in trained herding dogs. In addition, these migratory birds are important for our local community and ecosystem. Not only do they promote biological diversity and keep the balance of our ecosystem, they take care of insects, insects and algae in the ponds that they frequent. There are enough volunteers and, citizen, and concerned citizens here to form a subcommittee together with the golf courses to create a waterfall. Your time's water up. Fall. Please wrap up your comment. I'm just finished. I'm just finished. Please. There are enough concerned citizens and volunteers here to form a subcommittee and we can work with the golf courses to create a waterfowl and migratory bird management plan. We should all be taking this time now to explore all non-lethal options. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Patty Schenker. Still shows that you're on mute, Patty. You have to unmute yourself on your end. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Hobart and City Council members. My name is Patty Shanker, and I am here to voice my opposition to the coot shoots that have been going on in this city and urge you to find humane alternatives. Since the 1970s, I have been visiting this area of Palm Springs and Rancho Mirage. I even used to play golf here, and I now live in Palm Springs. Among the many things I love about this desert are the wildlife. Many residents and visitors to this area come to play golf or tennis, but many others are here to enjoy the wildlife. The fact that these shoots are done yearly only proves that this tactic is not working. As with many species, the killings cause the surviving ones to breed at an accelerating pace, exas exacerbating the problem. Plus, there are non-lethal alter alternatives, such as immediate corrective landscaping, removing cover shrubbery, using herbicides to eliminate aquatic vegetation, reducing fertilizer, especially around pond animal areas to make grass less nutritionally attractive, install fencing along banks, install effigies of alligators on ponds or flashing lights, install sonic devices, and spraying grape flavored deterrents on lawns. I am also concerned with the possible fire damage from danger, excuse me, fire danger from the gunshot blast, especially here in Southern California. And I know that many people, including myself, find the slaughter to be very upsetting. I urge you to discontinue these hunts immediately and permanently and insist that humane solutions be found so the coots can migrate safely through this area and the golfers can golf. Killing should never be the first resort that is lazy, uncreative, and cruel. As we see violence growing in our country, we need our leaders to lead us to a kinder, more compassionate world for all. 
including animals. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker will be Tammy Gordon. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Tammy Gordon, and I'm representing the Coachella Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District headquartered in Indio. Um, I would like to provide you with just a brief overview of the mosquito control in 2020. And although mosquitoes in the desert are present year round and are tested regularly, we typically only detect mosquito borne viruses such as West Nile seasonally as the desert warms in about April or May. In the city of Rancho Mirage, the district has two dedicated full-time state certified vector control technicians assigned to inspect for sources and respond to service requests within the city. Additional staff are assigned to support this technician and the city as necessary. Although there were over 200 mosquito samples to test positive for mosquito virus in 2020, none were in the, within the Rancho Mirage city limits. However, the spread of invasive mosquito in Rancho Mirage is becoming more noticeable to residents because of their aggressive and painful bite. And there was also one case, a human case of West Nile virus in the Coachella Valley in 2020. As we prepare for another mosquito season, we'd like to remind you that you can prevent mosquitoes from becoming an issue around your home and neighborhood by doing some of the following. Check your lawn drains for water and debris and clean your drain regularly. Inspect your lawn for any water sources, including any water holding containers, such as potted plants or bird baths. Clean and scrub pet dishes and water features weekly. And also swimming pools, ornamental ponds and fountains require working pumps and regular maintenance. The pandemic has hindered some of our aspects that are crucial to fighting vector-borne disease, which is community participation, particularly in removing sources from their yards. We would like to say a special thank you to the Rancho Mirage Code Compliance for collaborating with us and addressing some mosquito concerns. A special thank you to Pamela Berkey. Also, some of the city staff that helped spread the district messaging and participation of our Rancho Mirage Board of Trustee member, Isaiah Hagerman. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, the next speaker will be Bettina Ross Marino. Hi, thank you so much for hearing our concerns about the coot shoot that took place at the S in Rancho Mirage. We understand, we're asking the, the city council to disallow the shooting of American coots. We understand that this was a legal shoot, but the public outcry about this cruelty really was overwhelming. So we're asking the city pass an ordinance or referendum or even create a special policy to direct staff not to approve these shoots that will eventually become law. Perhaps this needs to be changed on the state level, but certainly the city has some leeway here to manage this change. There are other mitigation methods, which others have spoke about, and I work with Palm Springs Wildlife Advocates, and we're more than happy to extend our services to research what those uh, mitigation methods might be that are non-lethal. Um, and we're happy to work with the city to make those recommendations and staff we want to be of service. This is an opportunity for the city to take a more ethical and progressive approach. Please feel free to email us at Palm Springs Wildlife Advocates at yahoo.com and we're, we will be happy to uh, create any kind of uh, policy structure that might help you to uh, implement better methods. I love the idea that Randy brought up of a subcommittee The S Club created the perfect duck habitat and then killed wildlife when they shockingly flocked to that habitat. These are federally migra federal migratory birds and these shootings are killing birds who are beloved not just in this area, but also in the areas they migrate to and from. I won't take up more of your time, but please take this issue seriously. Please consider all of the comments that you are receiving here and please move forward in an ethical approach. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker will be Jane Garrison. You 
still, yep. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Jane Garrison, the founder and the president of Oswit Land Trust. Many of you may be familiar with Oswit Land Trust. We have uh, conserved some very important critical land here in the Coachella Valley. We have over 3,000 members, several hundred who are residents of Rancho Mirage. Um, I was incredibly shocked when the video was uh, sent to us regarding the shoot. I was so shocked because 25 years ago when I worked as a wildlife specialist, and at the time I had spent three months in Africa, I worked in Thailand and I focused on wildlife. 25 years ago, I worked with the Canyon Lake golf course on humane alternatives to having a coot shoot or a duck shoot. So my, I unfortunately, and um, in my being naive, I thought that no one did those anymore. So when I saw that video, I, I just, I couldn't believe it and I, wanted to actually also just reiterate some of the things that other speakers have said. There certainly is more effective ways than a half hour of shooting once a week for several months. Clearly that is not um, solving the perceived problem that the golf course is upset with. And as Randy and other speakers said, there are many humane alternatives. We are happy, we work directly with many wildlife biologists, ecologists, naturalists, in the Coachella Valley. I am happy to offer the assistance of any of those professionals to come up with a plan. Um, but I think that we all could agree by watching the video that there's a better way. And not only for the wildlife that's in that lake or in those ponds, but there's a better way and a better example that we can set to the rest of the community and to the kids who live in this Coachella Valley. And we need to teach everyone that we should always be humane. We should always be kind. We should always find an alternative way before we resort to killing and resort to cruelty. So I'm happy to offer any assistance, uh, oswitlandtrust.org, jane at oswitlandtrust.org, and I'm happy to help. And I thank you all very much. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker will be Kate Spates. Hello, I'm Kate Spates, Rancho Mirage resident for over six years, desert resident for over 40 years. I attended last city council meeting on February 18th via Zoom and watched as you spent nearly 40 minutes delivering highly orchestrated, condescending, defensive and dismissive statements that you all read word for word to vehemently deny anyone would want to move the meeting time or election dates. Who did you poll to get this vast majority you spoke of? My change.org petition currently has 311 signatures of actual people who support changing the meeting time to 5 p.m. and aligning the city council elections with state and federal elections. How dare you talk negatively about me and dismiss my concerns as political? You work for me. I am one of your constituents and I demand respect and a public apology. And I want to emphasize that Rancho Mirage Forward is not just me, it's a group of concerned residents. And by dismissing me, you dismissed all of us. Mr. Hobart incorrectly stated we were looking to change the time to 7 p.m. when we clearly said 5 p.m. He said it was utter nonsense. And talk of city council meetings going until midnight is actually the true utter nonsense. In the last three years, the average time of a city council meeting is 121 minutes. Starting at 5 p.m. would give people plenty of time to have dinner and attend other evening functions. Mr. Townsend criticized me for using an image of a woman at the mic of your city council meeting in my online petition. However, it's the thumbnail of your Rancho Mirage City Council meeting, May 18th, 2017. I was making a point about empty seats behind the speaker. I created this petition because I am looking to the future. Whether you choose to accept it or not, the demographics are changing. Nearly a third of the population is under 55 and nearly half of the population is under 65. It's not quite the retirement community you make it out to be. If a person who works wants to run for city council, it is a complete interruption to their workday to meet at 1 p.m. 
thereby effectively limiting city council members to retirees or people with the luxury of having free hours during the workday. It also limits real-time participation for residents to provide public comments. This current council cannot serve forever. So who will represent the people in the future? There needs to be age equality and equal representation for all, not just the elderly population. This council is a good old boys network and you should be ashamed at your behavior. You are ignoring a large part of your city and it must stop. Your single-mindedness has caused you to lose sight of what the job is. I'll wait for your apologies. The uh, next speaker, I just have a telephone number. Uh, so if your number ends in 8589, uh, please state your name for the record and make your non-agenda public comment. Yes, gentlemen, do you hear me? Yes, we can. Gentlemen, ma'am, okay, thank you very much. Brad Hirsch, resident of Rancho Mirage. Council members, I was horrified and disgusted to see the video of this senseless killing that took place at the S golf course on March 4th here in Rancho Mirage. We as a community are better than this. Take part of a humane, inhumane act of killing our wildlife. There, there's many other alternatives that should have been done and looked into. It was clear by the video how not to rely on common sense, but fall into the barbaric actions this is an extremely serious. This permit should not have been given out without the fully understanding and the ramifications. It was clear to me and these men that had no procedure in play and shooting at will makes this a criminal act by following no safety procedures. We should be extremely fortunate and lucky that nobody was killed or seriously injured. These men were inches away from killing someone. There's no justification shooting a gun just for the sport. As a taxpayer to the city, you are fully responsible in their actions. These men broke laws. I'm asking for a full explanation, legal actions to be levied by their lack of irresponsibility. Ignorance is not an excuse. Thank you. The uh, next speaker, again, has a telephone number uh, ending in 4200. Please state your name for the record and make your non-agenda public comment. It uh, shows your phone line is muted. Uh, try hitting star six on your phone. Uh, thank you for that. I didn't know about star six. I'm unmuted. My name is Tanya Petrovna. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and City Council. I am calling to please um, ask you to stop allowing the coot shoot and these migratory bird shoots that happen in the golf courses in your city. I was actually, you know, born and raised here, started my businesses here. I was shocked at the F Club, you know, it used to be called Desert Island for years. I did even work there in the 1980s in my 20s and my uh, best friend's father was the manager there where they actually had, uh, because of the Canadian population that wintered there, many uh, parties and events, I worked in the dining room, where they'd celebrate the arrival of the Canada geese. And I think, wow, how things have changed. In a world that's becoming more compassionate, people are really more concerned, and nature is just being completed, I, more and more, that I see uh, the need for, well, I, I didn't really even think this happened. And so much so that I would never have wanted to witness something like that, but having had a friend coming to town who wants to golf, and now it's called the S, it's open to the public. I drove in that day to see if what the golf was like there for her and her husband, they're avid golfers, and I decided to stay and see, because I'd heard about possibly their shooting birds, and I thought, that's the thing of the past, you know? And so I walked leisurely up and down, and they have a nice little rotunda there, or it's that, and, and decided to walk back, and then the shooting started. <laughs> And I mean, I'm shaking when she's talking about it. I could start crying because it was it was horrible to see. And then 
asking the gentleman to stop did, did absolutely nothing. They just shot over my head. And um, I, I don't know what to say. It was shock. When finally someone did drive up, I thought to help because I was calling for help. Uh, he just said, you're not supposed to be here. And I'm like, so when I get greeted at the entry and drive in, and I'm at, told where to park politely, that I'm not allowed in, I would never trespass. And then I read the city uh, notice that says there were trespassers, and the shoot was called off, and the trespassers left. It's like, excuse me, but who was trespassing? And to the city to put that in a public statement, uh, that, that that's just wrong. I just want to let you know that's wrong, but also to please then coerce you to, to stop signing off on these, to perhaps make it your policy to not allow this to happen. Um, you know, having had businesses here for years and continuing to do so, I have many customers that maybe are not calling in today, maybe have not written, but were, you know, outraged. And, and uh, so all I'm saying is there's a lot more you haven't heard from. And please, please let Rancho Mirage be the pillar of compassion and stop this. Thank you. All right. The uh, next speaker is Nancy French. Hi, my name is Nancy French. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Hi, thank you, Rancho Mirage City Council. I'm a volunteer with Palm Springs Animal Shelter and Animal Samaritans and a homeowner in the Cathedral City Cove on the border of Rancho Mirage. I'm also here to speak out against the city approving permits for shooting American coots, ducks, and all birds on their golf courses. When seeing the video that was shared, I was so disheartened to learn that the outdoor use of guns by public citizens was being permitted and even encouraged. Unsupervised gun use is just, it's dangerous. Those bullets don't go away. They drop somewhere and they pose a danger to the citizens of Rancho Mirage, people who are enjoying hikes and outdoor activities nearby. And this activity also normalizes gun use in public with very little oversight, and it's setting a very poor, unsafe example for such a beautiful town. And most importantly, this interferes with the wildlife that is vital to the ecosystem and is actually an attraction enjoyed by a majority of your citizens and those of us who work to preserve and encourage these animals to be part of our neighborhood. I'm here to ask that the city stop granting approval to use these barbaric methods immediately and work with the local wildlife organizations represented here today to provide better methods that do not include guns and public violence. Thank you for your time and your compassion. The next speaker is Josh Brown. Hello, I'm Josh Brown. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm a resident of Palm Springs, but I've been visiting and fell in love with the Coachella Valley back when I was 11 years old in 1958, when my parents brought me here. I've been here on a regular basis. My mother lived here for 30 years. So I have a love. I don't consider this specific town. First, thank you, all of you council members for allowing me to speak. Um, I consider this one large Coachella Valley and we're all, all in it together. I have gravitated to Jane Garrison's group, the Oswit Land Trust, because uh, my personal beliefs are I believe in life and nature. I believe there is an ethical solution to any difference. I know each of you have your own life experience. I respect that. We all come from different positions of life. Some of you may be moved by the words you've heard of the compassion for life. Others may consider it a uh, byproduct since we buy uh, killed uh, animals at the, at the grocery store. I, re I recognize that. I would like to bring attention though, having paid close attention recently in the past few months to um, gun, uh, uh, the ability to buy and regulate guns in the state of California. I researched it and in uh, 2020 recently uh, to acquire a gun requires that you, um, and, and I didn't plan on speaking, it was last minute, so please forgive me that I didn't script this out. 
A uh, firearm safety certificate is issued by the California Department of Justice. Uh, in order to get a certificate to own a firearm in California, you must pass a test. And in order to pass that test, the test is based on a book. And I'm looking at notes that I put in a post. And in that, in that uh, safety certificate book, which is where the test is derived from, one specific thing said is a bullet fired into the air can return to the ground with enough speed to cause injury or death. Now that is understood by everyone today if they want to buy a firearm and operate one. I want you to understand I have been raised, I, I was married to a man for 40 years who was a lawyer in house counsel, didn't go out and seek uh, causing damage through litigation, but there are plenty of people out there that would love to litigate based on the laws. And please pay attention to this to protect your time's your up. Please wrap up your comment. Yes, thank you. Please pay attention and know that you are representing all of us. Thank you for listening to me. The uh, next speaker is Rich Westman. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. My name is Rich Weissman. Uh, we live now in the uh, Valley for uh, uh, five years now. I love it here. Uh, and thank you for all your hard work on the, on the council. Uh, we also happen to have a place up in Central Oregon. Uh, also, uh, it's on a ranch. Uh, very similarly, we have a golf course and ponds and lakes. And the geese that are here now come visit us a little later in the season as they migrate north. Uh, we've had problems, lots of geese. Uh, sometimes they poo in different places, make a lot of noise, but certainly they are part of the environment and part of our system. And on the ranch, we have a policy where we do not shoot them, we do not kill them, but we use a bunch of non-lethal methods to mitigate uh, 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 the annoyance from, uh, uh, from uh, 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 geese. There are lots of ways in which you can deal with that. And we certainly deal with it up there in, in, in Oregon. And as such, I was appalled to learn that people are shooting at these beautiful animals who will soon be visiting us up in Oregon. And so I'm asking you to please permanently eliminate this practice. It doesn't belong in a civilized place like, uh, like the Coachella Valley. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, next speaker will be J.D. Horn. Hi, this is J.D. Horn. Um, I simply just want to add my voice to the people protesting these shootings as well. As many other people have stated, these animals don't belong just to this area. They belong to several areas and other areas value them. So I would appreciate your not allowing these shootings to continue. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Martin P. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Martin Prue. Uh, good afternoon uh, to the council and to the mayor. Um, you know, I'd like to reiterate a lot of the sentiments that have been already previously discussed. Uh, one of which is the idea of having dangerous and, and loosely su supervised shooting. Um, uh, the point is well taken that, you know, the, the gun safety rules in the state of California do not allow you to shoot up in the air. You're shooting near a residential uh, areas and, and, and people are, are not only living, but playing and, and rec recreation, bike riding along the areas. Um, in the video, you saw people, you know, kind of trying to stop them and, and, and just the, the attitude was very, you know, uh, it was, it was, it was like, they were, they were, we were ruining their fun. Um, there are plenty of places in the, in the valley for, for sportsmen to shoot legally where there's no danger of anyone getting hurt. Um, I love the point about the idea of, of you're being open to litigation if, if somebody does get hurt. Um, but I think the main point I really want to break out is not a day or so ago, six to eight people were gunned down 
Guns are never a solution. If you, if you encourage public use of firearms, and, and you know the excuse the guy used was, hey, I'm having a bad day. Well, what if one of those guys at the shoot is having a bad day or an argument with his wife? Uh, Martin, we, it's on your head. We can't hear you right now. Can you try speaking into your mic? You, can, you can't hear me? Now we can hear you again. You were fading out. Okay, well, my point is, look, you know, any one of those, those shooters could be having a bad day or be distracted or based on the fact that, you know, safe firearm practices aren't necessarily being enforced at these shoots. Um, the fact that people can wander onto the course and accidentally get shot. I mean, that, that is, uh, you know, uh, an exposure to your, your city. It's exposure to the golf course. And it's really unnecessary given the fact that there are humane solutions. My last point is this. You're using a 19th century solution for a 21st century problem. I think we can do better than that. Thank you for, my, for your time. Thank you. The next speaker will be Brad Anderson. Hi, yes, uh, Brad Anderson. I had to help my dog up. Uh, got an elderly dog in the house. So anyway, uh, uh, I thought I was going to miss this today. I had to go to the vet this morning, too. And uh, again, if these meetings were held later in the day, you know, would it be an issue uh, around business hours? But that's not really what I'm going to talk about. I wanted to kind of uh, uh, not attack, but go point by point what the counselor said at the last meeting, because I have it all written down, but I see there's another issue at hand. And apparently the city is issuing uh, permits to shoot, I guess. See, this is all new to me. I'm out of the show service network, lucky for the city. But anyway, uh, of course, uh, being from the city, I would be opposed to any senseless killing of anything. And that sounds like a senseless killing act. And uh, and I just want to give a little my two cents here. If this is true, if the city is 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 affected or is involved in these private properties allowing this to happen or giving giving credence or giving permission to do this, yes, they should be able to do that uh, because I won't be able to do it in my backyard. And I'm not saying this is a gun acts or gun rights policy. I'm all for uh, people are having, having firearms if they wish. And, but again, shooting in the city limits, this is unnecessary. Of course, we come from a city, the city of Ransom Morales has a long established history, along with the Coachella Valley, of items like this. Uh, I'm thinking of the duck ponds located out in the uh, Southern Sea area, Northern area, Mecca area. And that's all established by elites that, you know, for duck shooting. And it still goes on today. And there's millions of dollars spent out there from the Vector Control District to control mosquitoes for these duck ponds that only a few, I want to say one-handed, I could count people that attend these duck clubs. So that's an issue right there. And, and of course, Civic Center, I remember working over there, I want to say six years ago, probably roughly longer, but they, they poisoned all the uh, pigeons. You know, I came to work in the morning and there's pigeons everywhere dead. So this happens all the time. Uh, most of the time people don't know about it. Like, I don't know about this today. So I'm against this. If, 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 if the city has any involvement in this, they should it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. All right, that is the uh, end of our non-agenda public comments. Uh, so at this point, we will close that portion of the meeting and we will move to council member comments and I'll return this to you, Mr. Mayor, to manage that process. All right, does anybody have comments they'd like to make? Mr. Mayor? Yes. Hi, this is Richard. Hey, Richard, the floor is yours. Just want to take a few minutes to thank all the city staff for their excellent work during the challenging last year. Today, I'm going to give you just a few updates on what's really going on in the public works department of our city. In the pavement maintenance area, the Tamaris neighborhood is slated for slurry pavement maintenance starting in April. Before the slurry is applied, all the roadway cracks will be repaired and filled. In October, the rubber slurry will then be applied. This slurry will make all the streets look fresh and will preserve the pavement on all the area roadways. If you're wondering 
about your street and when it will be maintained or paved. The city of Rancho Mirage has a payment maintenance six year schedule for all our streets. You can check out the city website under Public Works Department. There is a map that will show you the maintenance schedule for every street in our city. The city is also considering an expansion of Wolfson Park at Duval and Frank Sinatra. Plans are being designed for the expansion and will include a much needed on-site parking. The Community Parks and Trails Commission is hosting a community workshop to gather public output. The city would love to hear what you have to say. So join the Zoom meeting and give your ideas for this beautiful expansion. The Zoom meeting will be Wednesday, March 31st at 4 p.m. That again is Wednesday, March 31st. The Zoom link can be found on the city's website at the Public Works Department page or by calling the city clerk at 760-324-4511. Look forward to this exciting revision of one of our largest parks in the city. So at this time, turn it back to you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to make a comment? Seeing no hands. Mr. Yes. Mayor, I have a comment to make. I was Can you hear me? I was surprised that it seemed like you didn't, but you do. Okay. Go ahead. Was, okay, as long as you can hear me. Um, I do have some comments to make uh, regarding uh, some of the comments that were made here today. But at first, I want to ask uh, Isaiah, number one, um, if a, there is a cost for a special election uh, in our April election time. Um, so the city council uh, elections in April of each year are not special elections. Those are our normal elections. And um, there is no cost difference to the city between having our election in April or aligning them with the state or federal elections. Okay, thank you so much. And secondly, and, more, and most importantly, I want to thank all the speakers who spoke here today uh, we do listen, we hear your voices, and we are very fortunate uh, that you feel comfortable coming and telling us your thoughts and your concerns. So I wanted to address um, some of the comments that were made. Um, in particular, I wanted to address uh, the comments um, in regard to uh, something that I have received. In fact, I have received 16 letters, um, emails actually, uh, in regard to the uh, changing of the time for our meetings, as well as changing the date of our elections. And although I did not receive uh, this petition or whatever you want to call it, that went out, I would like to read what it says. Uh, because there were five, it was a form letter, or it could be turned into a form letter, and people could just forward it on to the city council. Uh, there were five of these letters that were submitted to me, and I imagine most of the other city council members. And um, I will just read it quickly, what it says. Dear city council, a new poll on Facebook shows that 93% of our city wants change. They want our city council meetings to start at 5 p.m. and they want our elections aligned with federal elections. I ask that you take action to implement these two things. Thank you. And um, that those were all received by Don J, James S, James P, Glenn V, Teresa O. And then there was another uh, letter received from James C, 
who also made similar comments. And then there was another letter, letter that was written by a Patricia W. And her comments were that, uh, why is the city council hiding our meetings behind closed doors and having an, at a convenient time when she feels uh, most of us have personal agendas. So first of all, we do not have our city council meetings behind closed doors. Yes, we have our closed session behind closed doors as does every other city that I'm familiar with. So we have our closed sessions behind closed doors, but our city council meetings are always open. They are always encouraging for people to come to our podium to air our views, their views, and to let us know their thoughts and their concerns. Um, she also commented that um, she feels most of us have our personal agendas. Well, we do have our personal agendas, uh, but it's not personal for financial gain for any of us. I have my own agenda, and I think most of us do, and that's why we are elected, because we want the very best for the residents and businesses and visitors to Rancho Mirage. We want the very best library and observatory. We want the very best amphitheater. We want the very best where we can underground our utility wires. We want the very best so we are able to rubberize our streets. We have our synchronized signals because we want the very best traffic flow. And we have a huge amount of bicycle paths and both on the, the street and behind the curb. So that is part of my agenda. And I think we have all made it very clear that our agendas include all good things for all the people that live here, that come here and that do business here. But I also want to read some of the letters that have been sent in uh, that have a different point of view. And um, these letters were written also by, and there are nine of them, Steve G, Pat D, Roger C, Jim and Patty W, Jeff M, James R, William S, Keith K and Ron S. So there are nine of those, and I would like to read some of their comments also. And the one from Steve G says, my thoughts, disagree. Move meetings to Saturday, not evenings. Evenings are family time, signed by Steve G. Then the one from Pat D says that I would like the city council to officially consider changing the special election to align our elections with federal elections. As far as changing the meeting time, the city has an extremely high number of retired people. And so I don't think that changing the time of the meeting will make any difference. Today with so much access to Zoom, to emails, to FaceTime, Facebook, old fashioned mail, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think anyone would have any problem conveying their opinion to their city council. And I agree that it's all political BS. And we certainly have enough of that in all politics now. Keep up the good work and I vote you all in again, even if the election doesn't match up with federal election dates. Thank you for your good service. And it is signed Pat D. Another letter says, and this is from Roger C. The rent RM forward movement is ridiculous. Keep the times where they are. 
or the city council decides when and where they meet. I support the council and suspect the vast majority of our city does likewise. And this is signed by Roger C. The next one is from Jim W. And he says, I think you are doing a great job, but this seems like a very reasonable request. And unless there is a compelling reason not to, the city council should change its meeting time to early evening between five and seven and align with our elections with federal elections. And it is signed from Jim and Patty W. And then from Jeff M, I would like the city council to officially consider and defeat, which is in capital letters, changing the meeting time to five o'clock. I do support aligning our elections with federal elections mm -hmm. only if there is a financial benefit to do so. And then there's the letter from James R. I am not signing this ridiculous petition. The city of Rancho Mirage is the best run city in the Valley. I wonder how many people that signed have ever considered attending or ever had the need to attend a meeting. And yes, I work and the meetings are during my work day. Please keep up the great work signed Jim R. And then William S. signed sent a note saying, anyone that has an opinion on an issue before the council should certainly be able to find the time to attend and commit regardless of when the council meets. 1.2% of the population is hardly a groundswell. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And Keith K writes, keep doing what you're doing. It is working and you are keeping Rancho Mirage from becoming <clears throat> the blank that is now the state of California. He also says, I do not support anything that Rancho Mirage Forward is proposing. All of you have done a marvelous job serving our community. I strongly suspect that Rancho Mirage Forward is a group of disruptors from outside of our fair city with devious motives. Please, please ignore everything they are saying. I've seen this movie before and we don't want to end up like and he states two other cities, which I will not mention. And the last letter I wanted to read is that from Iran S. The Rancho Mirage City Council is one of the most inclusive governing bodies in the state. It is free of politicians motivated by a quest for power like each of the political wannabes that have attempted to gain council seats by inventing untrue reasons to change the unique culture of Rancho Mirage. This city council has fostered the only city in California to maintain a debt-free budget with a surplus every year, which has been utilized to add benefits to the community without incurring debt, i.e its award-winning public library, observatory, free ambulance service for residents, synchronized traffic lights, and our beautiful park, public parks, just to name a few. It is the reason they have successfully defended their seats on the council. Every council meeting is open to the public and videotaped from the pledge to the flag to its conclusion then aired on public access TV for anyone who is interested in viewing their actions. Fortunately, any resident of this remarkable city who is displeased with its flawless management has the privilege of moving to one of the other cities in the Valley. So those are the letters that I received, which I think give a lot of input and give a lot of opinions. And um, as you heard, Jim and Patty W said, 
we're doing a great job changing time of meeting seems reasonable unless there's a compelling reason not to. Well, actually, there are three compelling reasons that the meeting time was changed in 1997, which was 25 years ago, not to be more convenient for the council members, but to number one, accommodate disabled and those not being able to drive at night. It was changed to accommodate those with charitable events they wanted to attend for evening business commitments or family commitments. And number three, it was changed to help staff members and their family commitments and not having a 15 or 16 hour day. And it would also save money by not serving dinners to staff members or the city council. And regarding change the election date, it was changed from November to April at some time. And it was changed so people would not be inundated with election material having to do with other elections, primarily the federal election. Most of those um, information, pamphlets, flyers, and uh, information of all types usually ended up in the trash. But having our election in April gave our residents the opportunity to really study the mailers and the issues that were being presented. It gave all kinds of information related to anything that was on the uh, opinion list of people who wanted to make changes or wanted to serve on the council, but it also educated people so that when they made their decision and how they voted, they would know who they felt was the best candidate and how they wanted to address whatever <laughs> issues were on the ballot. So what is really fascinating to me because we keep hearing that 93% of our city wants change. Well, in 2020, the Rancho Mirage population was 18,378 people. And those are people who live here full time, which means that 17,091 residents signed up for change. Although, as you heard, from Kate Spates, she had 300 people listed on her petition or whatever she calls it. But what is more fascinating is that only 12,490 residents are actual registered voters in Rancho Mirage. And of those 12,490, only 5,557 registered voters actually voted. So that's less than one third of the residents who actually cast their vote in 2018. So I've, it's absolutely remarkable that this survey or petition showed that 17,000 Rancho Mirage residents responded to this request for changes and who actually want changes. So in light of the 16 letters I received, although five of them were really just a form that you had to just sign or type in your name and address and then push the button and it would go off to the uh, recipients. Although I need to mention that there are a number of very reliable sources who have informed me that there are many, many people who signed this petition who don't actually live in Rancho Mirage. And to sign this petition, apparently you don't need to live in Rancho Mirage. And you don't even need to live in California. And you don't even need to live in America, probably. Anyone can sign. So I think it would be a really good idea 
to have the peoples whose names are listed as signees on this petition or list submit it to our city for our Rancho Mirage public records and for the public records that can be disseminated if needed when requested. And I want you to know that I believe everyone who comes here and speaks at our podium. I think most of us believe people. We value their opinions and we want to hear what they have to say. However, I think it's very important that we verify the facts and we verify all these signatures of these 300 people that signed on or the 17,000 that actually want change. Because apparently from this 93%, there are 17,000 people that are included that want change. So I also found it fascinating because if you look at our city council chambers during our city council meetings, there are never more than 15 or 20 people in the audience, unless there's a major issue. And of course, if there's a major issue, then there's standing room only. Now I moved here with my husband in 2021. Strike that, 2001. So it was 20 years ago in September. I started attending a variety of events and my husband and I started attending city council meetings. We thought they were fabulous. And my husband, who was a retired attorney, marveled at the Rancho Mirage way of doing business. He said it was the finest example of democracy in civics that he had ever seen. And we could never understand why so few people attended our city council meetings. We always encouraged people that we met, whether it was friends or neighbors or events, please come to these council meetings. They're very interesting. You can really learn a lot about your city. And most of them said, I'm really not interested. I'm not interested because this is a perfect city. There's no issues. I don't need to attend the meeting unless I hear that something is really pressing, where they're going to vote on something that is going to change dramatically uh, the fabulous quality of life we all experience. So when I got involved in the city, I got involved and wanted to serve and did so on the Library Friends. I also served on the Cultural Commission. I also served on three different committees from College of the Desert. I attended and still do attend at least a hundred meetings and events every year. And never once in 20 years did I ever hear one word about mm. changing our time of our meetings or changing our election dates? In fact, I had only heard compliments. People said, you're doing the right thing. You're smart. You have everything addressed properly. And the fact that you hold your elections in April gives us the opportunity to really evaluate the candidates that are running and what their purposes are and what their platforms are. However, if there are 17,000 residents in Rancho Mirage that want to come to our meetings and want to participate and want to have their voices heard, I am thrilled and I will be glad to vote for a change of time. And if we have 17,000, or we have 15,000, or 10,000, or 5,000, or even if we have 500 residents that show up to come to our city council meetings and want to voice their opinion, or just want to sit and listen 
and enjoy what is going on and enjoy how perfectly we conduct our meetings and how we listen to everyone, we will find a way to accommodate them. We can always put extra seating in our lobby where we have a television on the wall. We can always add extra seats out on our patio at the front entrance. And we can even put seating and bring in a television in our parking lot. If we have 500 or 1,000 or 5,000 people that want to attend our meetings and really think that we should change our meeting time so they can participate because they don't have an opportunity to participate, we want them here and we want to know how they can be involved. They can voice their opinions. They can play a significant part in Rancho Mirage. And they can also start by volunteering on one of our commissions. And just for those who are not aware of our commissions, we have probably 15 commissions that are an absolute joy for people to volunteer their time. And we, on Janu June 1st of every year, we appoint new commissioners or we reappoint the existing commissioners. So to sum up my comments, the council is always happy to hear your opinions and your comments. Please feel free to send me an email. Please feel free to send it the old fashioned way through the mail, or please feel free to come to our city council meetings. Our city hall is open for you. It's open for anyone to speak, even if they are not members of our Rancho Mirage residency. If you can't do any of those, give me a call at City Hall. I will be glad to call you back and I'll be glad to hear whatever your comments are. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Iris. Mr. Just, Mayor, this is Charlie. Charlie, I do just have just, a few words, if I may. Charlie. Charlie, no. yeah, you may, you may in just one second. Sure. I, just want, I just wanted to add a PS, what was said uh, by Ms. Smotrich. Uh, people apparently are saying that they would like to have the voting uh, be done simultaneously with the federal votes. Uh, we have gone through experiments over the years and at least in the last three or four that I'm kind of re still remembering. Uh, we have the city vote in April. We have the public vote in November. Uh, the public vote in November has been somewhere between, I don't know, 37 or 8 percent and 40, low 40s, very, never hit the 50s uh, yet. Our elections held where they are the only issue for voters to be concerned about. Our, <clears throat> our voting uh, returns have been over 50% in the last at least three elections, probably further than that. I just don't want to exaggerate. So one of the reasons uh, is that we keep the election day as, as is because democracy is better the more people who uh, participate in it. And more people participate in voting in the Rancho Mirage election than do in the presidential election or the off-year federal elections. So uh, not that that will change the minds of some of the people. I noticed some of my uh, former opponents uh, um, being involved in the presentation today. Uh, that shows you the only issue, or the only major issue, if that's a major issue, that they have is to say, uh, we should have our votes with in November with the federal election and matters of similar uh, level of importance. Anyway, go ahead, Charlie. I just wanted to make that point clear. It's a very, it's a very good point, and a lot of stuff 
was covered by Iris and by you, Dana. But I do have some things that can uh, are repeated, but there are some things that I can add to what was said here today. So I will read what I have written. Yeah, As you have heard here today, a change is being promoted by a new group of concerned citizens who do not like the way Rancho Mirage future is going. So they formed the Rancho Mirage Forward. Is that really the reason that they formed Rancho Mirage Forward? Stay tuned on that one. The latest e-blast from this group was sent out seeking a change of council meeting time slot from one o'clock to five in the evening. We've discussed that. But the reason that was given so that younger people can attend those meetings. Also, the election time slot, as we talked about, should be changed to coincide with the national elections, the reason given in the last to save money, though they say. The true answers are as follows. First, the latest 2020 census count for Rancho Mirage residents is still 65% plus adults. Two, this time slot has been in effect since 1997, as Iris said, with input by the residents of Rancho Mirage 24 years without a comment from any resident to change till now by this newly formed assemblage. Three, as for the voting date, and I quote from the state, according to the Riverside County of Registered of Voters Office, the estimated cost for the 2022 election coming up is $50,000, whether it is held in April or November. An April election is a standalone with no cost added. Sharing It is also an all-male ballot. There are no polling place costs, however. The November election if we did that, has a cost sharing, but it also has a polling place cost sharing. Two additional costs to the $50,000 that we spend in April. Addressing just these two items that they said in their eve last, untrue, untrue. We went through this saga, didn't we? Last council meeting and I addressed my concerns which you can Google, and I don't want to bore you with what I said at that time to repeat it again today, because that would be ridiculous. A look at the latest Facebook poll, according to this group, Rancho Mirage Forward, which already has been addressed here today by Dana and by Ms. Smart. I guess the best city in the Valley is not good enough for these folks. Let me share with you some of the accomplishments that your council has achieved to date. And this is not a list of all of them, and Iris covered other ones that I don't have here, but I'm gonna read them. We have a $62 million reserve, building the best award-winning library and observatory, six park, dog park, many local programs for the residents, too many to even mention here, best streets, bike paths, riding trails, state-of-the-art amphitheater, major golf courses, best neighborhood, best gated communities, new developments on the books, along with a 620-acre resort approved and ready to begin construction. With a 34-acre lagoon, 1,928 homes and condos, two hotels and village business districts and jogging paths. I continue. Free ambulance service, home to the best award-winning hospital in the nation, home to the world-renowned Annenberg Estate, <clears throat> home to the Ritz-Carlton, and other major hotel chains. Country clubs, legendary restaurants, along with many other projects on the list coming forward, stay tuned. Protecting residents with the best police and fire departments, and I could go on and on and on. The point here is this group wants to change what? This group wants to Rancho Mirage going forward. Let me tell you guys this. Rancho Mirage has and will continue going forward every day. 
it is obvious that Ranch Mirage Forward, they have their own agenda of special interests in mind. And I guess it is not for the betterment of Ranch Mirage, but for their own interests. And I leave you to make your own conclusions and decisions on what is going on there. It, this council, your council, your council, always works with respect to all concerns that come before us moving forward with the best outcome for all the residents of Ranch Mirage, keeping us the best run city now and in the future. And I will end with saying one of the things that this lady said about my referencing her putting on her whatever it was, uh, an elderly lady so she could show the empty seats. Let's look at what that picture came to in 2017. Google it and you'll see Dana Hobart leaning over the dais to help this woman. But my point is she had to go back, this person, through over 90 some council meetings to come up with this woman to show an empty seat. That's a real stretch. And this is what you're dealing with. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if, if I may make a statement. Well, uh, let's see, maybe we should just start cutting them off. Oh, well, <laughs> never mind, never mind, go ahead. Trust me, this is gonna be very brief. No, no, no. Yes, it is. Uh, but I do wanna say, and Charlie, I love your emotion, I love your passion. Um, thank you, thank you, Ted. Absolutely. The, the, the issue regarding the dates of the election uh, and the time of the council meetings, frankly, uh, in my opinion, truly is a non-issue. Um, I think to some degree, maybe people are insulted when it's, they're accused of, of having a political motivation. Doesn't matter to me what their motivation is. The point is, let me tell you about my own survey. As many of you know, uh, I am out and about in the community daily. Uh, I see a lot of you. Uh, some of you may know that I even frequent Starbucks on occasion, uh, like daily, and other areas in the city. I have asked in the last two weeks various people, some of whom I have known, others that I'm not familiar with, has the time of our meetings ever been an obstacle for you? Has there ever been a situation where you feel that you can't make a meeting and or it's inconvenient for you to call in if you had an issue? I also ask about the elections and do you find it either confusing to have it in April as opposed to coincide with national election? Now, the other uh, aspect of this is I also ask them, are you a Rancho Mirage resident? In, in the case of, and I'm, I'm approximating, probably 35 people in the last two weeks, 80% were Rancho Mirage residents, the others were not. I found literally not one not one that endorsed the idea of changing either the time or the date of the national election. So when we hear figures like 93%, I'm telling you, here's a survey that indicates 100%. It's merely a question of how these questions are phrased and who they're presented to. So. Candidly, I, I believe it is a non-issue. I believe, as Richard Kite said at the last meeting, in his 20 years uh, on the city council, never once has he ever been asked about changing the time of the uh, meetings. The same with Mayor Hobart. He said never once has he been asked, and I endorse that as well. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a non-issue, and... Uh, I'm pleased that we're able to do this and accommodate as many people as we can. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. You're welcome. And if I didn't make my point clear, we, we get more votes for, the, for our local election 
by holding it and holding the election in uh, over, uh, July, what, what's our month? April. By holding the election in April, we get more votes cast than are cast in the November election. With all the stuff they've got going, they haven't hit 50% I don't think in a while, if ever, but I'm not sure about that. We, on the other hand, have over 50% in our elections. Uh, and people have time to concentrate. They have time to look at the ballot and send that, send that in. Those are all by mail, so they don't have to go in. We don't have to have a, a place for them to go in and vote in person. Anybody that tells you that we are at a bad time, uh, or a time that favors the incumbents in some way, which uh, the uh, friend of one of the people who spoke uh, has said erroneously numerous times. Uh, this is the first, this is the beginning apparently of the election season. So I look forward to seeing uh, what people have to say uh, as time marches on. Okay, I have nothing further. Does anybody else have anything they want in? Richard, do you? Yes. Open all you have to say. And all that needs to be said has been said and much more. Thank you. And Iris, you're done. Charlie, you're done. Well, you know what? Yes. I was just thinking, should I say this or not say this? Oh, Does that person Charlie. really want an apology from us? Did you hear what she said about this council? If anybody needs an apology, it's from her. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we will close uh, council member comments and move to city manager comments. Uh, none today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Trying to save time, eh? <laughs> Not a bad idea. Uh, can we have a motion with respect to the minutes? I'll make that motion. What motion? You have to say what? That motion to accept the minutes. Of last approve, meeting. Motion to approve the minutes. I'll oh, second that motion. Okay. Yes. Uh, Dana, Dana, I was trying to be quick. <laughs> Can we, uh, uh, well, let's just vote moving quickly forward. Councilmember uh, Tice? We, uh, the city clerk will take a roll call vote. Okay. Christy, would you do it, please? Councilmember Kite? Yes. Councilmember Smartridge? Yes. Councilmember Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. We'll move to the consent calendar and now we'll go to Isaiah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of the city council, you have five items on your consent calendar for consideration. Item number one is to receive and file the city board and commission annual reports. Item number two is a joint use agreement for electrical utility line undergrounding between Southern California Edison Company and the city of Rancho Mirage. Item number three is to approve California Choice Energy Authority entering into a long-term renewable energy agreement on behalf of the Rancho Mirage Energy Authority. Item number four are contracts and item number five are demands. Uh, staff is available to answer any questions before we go to council comments or questions. If there's any member of the public that would like to speak on the consent calendar, now is the time to do so. If you are participating remotely and you are on the Zoom platform, you would hit the raise hand button. If you are participating on the telephone, you would hit star nine on your telephone to make a public comment on the consent calendar at this time. Before we go to our remote audience, is there anyone here in person that would like to make a comment on the consent calendar? Okay, seeing no one here in person and seeing no one in our remote audience, we will close the public comment and I'll turn this over to you, Mr. Mayor. I say, uh, I say, uh, could we pull item number three, please, and have a little more detail on that? Yes. You want to take that before 
the vote or at, well, let's, let's take it first so we can add it to the vote. Go ahead, Richard. What is it you uh, want to discuss? Just the overall direction of the of the uh, item. If you give a little background on it. Sure. So uh, with the Ranch Mirage Energy Authority, our commitment to the community is to save them money on their generation rates and then also to uh, provide a greener energy mix than Southern California Edison. So uh, as we've done in the past, uh, the Ranch Mirage Energy Authority contracts for renewable energy that we then turn around and supply to our community. So this is another one of those contracts for the Ranch Mirage Energy Authority so that we can supply renewable energy to our customers. And this is a special area that we're providing? I didn't quite hear you. Can you repeat that question? Is this a special area that has not been included in the past? No, this is a standard. Uh, we do this from time to time as we um, negotiate these contracts. So they're all bid out to the various uh, renewable energy providers uh, that are approved within uh, uh, by the state. And then based on price and term and uh, we select uh, the bidder or the winner based off that negotiated process. Uh, so really we're, we're looking for the term that we need for our community and the best price. Thank you. Any other questions? On that? Can we have a motion please? I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. Please vote. Christy, will you please take a roll call vote? Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Christy. We will now move to our public hearings. Uh, item number six on our agenda is single family permit case number SFP 20 0023 and minor conditional use permit case number CUP 20-0008. And Pilar Lopez, our assistant planner, will handle this presentation. Pilar. Thank you, Isaiah. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. I have for your consideration single family permit case number SFP 20-0023 and minor conditional use permit case number CUP 20-0008. A request from Guy Dreyer Designs on behalf of Eric and Orly Presser. The applicant requests the construction of a custom single-family residence with the second-story element above the center of the home and a sports court. The proposed home is located at 4 Rancho Clancy and approximately 450 feet from Clancy Lane. The property is within the residential estate zoning district. The parcel measures one acre in size and is located within the Clancy Ranch Estates Homeowners Association. The HOA approved the preliminary plans for the proposed project at a maximum height of 25 feet. The proposed project is for the construction of a custom single family residence with a second story element above the center of the home, a detached casita and a sunken pickleball sports court. The first floor of the main residence is 7,067 square feet, and the second story is 1,583 square feet. A 1,215 square foot attached four car garage and a detached 531 square foot casita are two added amenities that complement the main home. The home totals 8,813 square feet on grade. This includes the main home's first floor, the garage, and the casita. In total, the proposed project measures 10,396 square feet. The 1,583 square foot second story will feature two separate bedroom suites. The second story windows along the north elevation will be clear story windows, which will allow natural light into the space while protecting the privacy of the future neighbors to the north. The windows on the south elevation of the second story will enjoy mountain views in that direction. Privacy concerns have been mitigated with the inclusion of trees along the southern property line. Mature olive trees will be imported to the site to create an immediate privacy buffer along the south property line. 
as stipulated in section 17.30.230, sports courts are allowed within residential zoning districts subject to the approval of a minor conditional use permit. The pickleball sports court will have no exterior illumination and will be sunk in a minimum of five feet in order to comply with the minimum setback distance of five feet from the rear and side property lines. The sports court meets all applicable setback and development standards. In accordance with the city of Rancho Mirage's land use element of the general plan, two-story homes may be considered if they meet certain policies and programs. The majority of the home measures between 14 feet 6 inches and 19 feet 6 inches and is below the maximum 20-foot height requirement listed in section 17.08.020 of the Municipal Code. The elements that exceed the 20-foot maximum height are the two bedroom suites which are proposed at a maximum height of 25 feet and the vaulted ceilings at the entry. The windows along the south elevation of the second story take full advantage of the prevailing mountain views in that direction. Privacy concerns have been mitigated with the inclusion of trees along the southern property line. Mature olive trees, which will be approximately 20 to 25 feet in height, will be imported to the site to create an immediate privacy buffer along that property line. The second story element is located in the middle of the home and carries the following setbacks, 42 feet in the north side, 111 feet in the rear, 55 feet 4 inches on the south side, and 72 feet 2 inches in the front. The ridge over the second floor area is 25 feet at its peak. This 25 foot high structure requires setbacks increases of 10 feet per side, which will result in the following minimum setbacks. The north side 20 feet, the rear 35, the south side 20, and the front 35. As shown, these minimums are exceeded. Placing the home in the center of the lot ensures minimal impacts to the surrounding homes. The second story element is approximately 187 feet from the existing home to the east and 235 feet from the existing home to the south. Currently, there are vacant properties to the west and north, but if the properties develop to their maximum setback, the second story element will be 67 and 100 feet respectively. The subject slide shows the site line analysis for the proposed property and its impact on the vacant lot to the north and the existing home to the south. The red outline shows the potential impact of the city's allowable building height and envelope if the home were under 20 feet in height. The five foot increase in height has been positioned in the middle of the one acre parcel, as far away from the adjacent neighbors as possible. The properties to the north are currently vacant parcels zoned as very low density residential. In the future, those parcels can be developed with single family homes 25 feet from the subject site's northern property line. The second story element would then be approximately 67 feet from the nearest residence structure. There is an existing 30 foot high structure to the south of the subject parcel. The existing structure is approximately 235 feet away from the proposed second story element. The applicant has paid special attention in the placement of the additional height and has included multiple mitigation measures to decrease potential concerns. These include increased setbacks. As stated before, both the general plan and the municipal code require the city council to make certain findings in order to grant approval of two-story structures. The subject slide shows a site line analysis for the proposed property and its impact to the existing home to the east. The red outline shows the potential impact of the city's allowable building height and envelope if the home were under 20 feet. The existing single family home to the east is situated approximately 87 feet from the proposed home's second story element. Existing and future vegetation, which will measure approximately 10 feet in height, will help screen the second story element, in addition to the increased setbacks. The Rancho Mirage Municipal Code requires a minimum of one 36 inch box tree and two 24 inch box trees per residence in the front yard. 
the proposed landscape plan exceeds these requirements with an assortment of 79 palm trees, 31 mature olive trees, five Palo Verde trees, three Texas ebony trees, and 12 citrus trees. Artificial turf is proposed in the front entry and in the center and north gardens. A standout feature of the home is the proposed swim channel, which wraps around the southern and eastern boundary. The swim channel and pool are bordered by large boulders and create a natural appearance. A condition of approval has been added that requires the Coachella Valley Water District to approve the proposed water usage. Public notices were sent out prior to the February 11 Planning Commission meeting and once again prior to this hearing. Staff received two comments in opposition prior to the February 11 Planning Commission meeting. These comments were made available to the Council. No further comments were submitted to staff. It's important to note that there are no view protection rights in the city's municipal code. There is no variance being issued for this project as the proposed project meets all development standards. The city council is required to make certain findings in order to grant approval to two story structures. Those findings have been made and presented to the council. The planning commission recommended that the city council approve one, the filing of a categorical exemption of environmental impact pursuant to section 15303 class three of the California Environmental Quality Act for new construction and two, single family permit case number SFP 20-0023 and minor conditional use permit case number CUP 20-0018. Eight, sorry. Subject to the list of conditions of approval and pursuant to the content and findings in the staff report. This concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Pilar. Uh, let's go ahead and open up the public hearing on this item. If any member of the public would like to speak on this item, now's the time to do so. If you are on Zoom, you would hit the raise hand button. If you are on your telephone, you would hit star nine to participate in this public hearing. Before we go to our remote audience, is there anyone here in person that would like to make a comment? Come forward. Good afternoon, my name is Dr. Eric Presser, and uh, it's an honor to come before you today, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. As a year-round member of Rancho Mirage since 2012, and as a local thoracic surgeon, it was extremely important to us that we create our dream home that is considerate of the surrounding neighbors and positively impacts the development. We made a concentrated effort to retain a renowned architectural firm and produce a tasteful residence that is proportionately scaled to the lot. Every effort has been made to have the second story centered in the lot, situating it as far as possible from neighboring houses and keeping it really narrow. In fact, we have building heights that are substantially lower than our maximum 20 feet height allowances in most areas and are as far away from the setback lines as possible. The two-story two design was extremely important to us to provide our two teenage children privacy as they grow older. The current house design by Guy Dreyer and his team provides not only a beautiful residence that complements the existing community, but it also takes into consideration the surrounding neighbors and future neighbors view corridors to ensure that their properties are not unduly burdened or negatively impacted. What makes this even more of an amazing story is that Today, my wife and I are actually celebrating our 20th anniversary. 20 years ago today, we were married in Laguna Beach, California. And I promised her a few things. One of them was to get her back to California. The other was to work as hard as I could for my family. I came from very humble upbringings. So the fact that I am here before the mayor, the council, and the city to present such a project almost makes me want to cry. I wanna thank you all for your time, your energy, and we love Rancho Mirage. We've lived all over the country, from New York City, to San Antonio, to New Orleans, to Chicago, and we are proud to now call Rancho Mirage our definitive home. Thank you. Congratulations, happy anniversary. Is there uh, anyone else here in person that would like to 
uh, make a public comment. Seeing none, we'll go to our remote audience. Seeing no one on our remote audience, uh, we will close the public hearing and I'll turn this over to the council. Uh, thank you. Uh, I do have a couple of questions uh, that uh, the doctor may be able to uh, help me with. To begin with, uh, we received a letter from attorneys uh, from Bird, Dale, Steve, and from Bird, uh, of, uh, where are they from? Palm Springs, who represent the um, owners of the property immediately to the north, I think it is, of um, this proposed project. Uh, they raised several issues about the propriety of the development of the second story where they feel it will block their view and impede their views to some large extent. Uh, as we know, but I would like to read it anyway. As we know, the city's municipal code uh, expressly states uh, a variety of things having to do with uh, structures that uh, exceed 20 feet. Uh, it's this is what section A says. Additional height restrictions in all zoning districts, the maximum building height shall not exceed 20 feet as measured from the finished grade to the highest point of the structure, excluding chimneys. I would like, uh, Ms. Lopez, if you could, to tell us what the additional five feet impedes as far as uh, the house that uh, is yet to be built on the remaining vacant land behind this house. Uh, of course, what? I... Oh. Yes, please. So this question came up during our planning commission meeting and the applicant, let me share you one second. The applicant actually went ahead and gave us this additional exhibit. So you can see here, this is the property in question that had some issues. Oh, oh, give us a second to bring that up. Oh, give me one second. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so as I was saying, this was an issue that came about during our planning commission and the applicant went ahead and provided this exhibit. This exhibit shows the property in question. And is this looking northeast, south, or west? This is the east. Looking east? Looking west. Looking west. Mm -hmm. But it's the property to the, to the east of the subject site. Mm. So as you can see, in it, it, it is that property, is that the, uh, the additional, who is the owner of the other piece of property? Uh, that this, is, this, law firm this is the property where the attorney, I believe, Mr. Edelston. Anderson, uh, Anderson property, right? Yes. Okay. So are we standing, or is the photographer standing on Anderson property right now, looking west? Yes, so, so what this exhibit shows us is that although the, the property is being grant, is, is proposed at 25 feet, if the property was j just following the 20 foot height limit, it would in include um, a higher impact to the subject site over here, the Morningstar Road property, than it is now, as you can see through these exhibits. I'm not quite sure I understand. So, do you see the red? Let me phrase my question. What the, the issue to me is the the, the Mr. Mayor, if I can just simply put the uh, uh, second story element is set back so far from the uh, property that you're asking about. That's that's what this is demonstrating. Is that the view corridor is actually no different and actually because of the setback um, 
it, it doesn't matter that this site's at 20 feet or 25 feet because of the distance where that second story element is set back. So it's so deep in the site and so far away from that property that over that distance, that five feet doesn't matter. And I will add that public notices went out again and for the second time, there was no additional public comment from this property owner or its attorney. Uh, are you suggesting that they're withdrawing their uh, objection to approval of uh, as per uh, your report? Because so if you are, then I, I don't have any further questions. This exhibit was new. It wasn't included as part of the planning commission package. Once it was presented, the attorney, I, I believe, didn't have anything else to add. If he would, he would have been able to submit an additional public comment. I think somewhere in this report, it was raised the possibility, and I'm not sure if it was in this report or I just was thinking about it, but uh, as big as that lot is, how prohibitive would it be, uh, either financially or otherwise, to um, take the two upstairs apartments and simply put them downstairs, thus leaving the uh, property that is owned by the so, Henderson? Yeah, so, so the sight line analysis that you just looked at says if, if you condition that and just said, hey, get rid of that extra five feet, there's no difference in the sight line for the property owner that had the concern. So you are conditioning nothing. There would be no point to that condition with respect to sight lines. It wouldn't matter. That's what that sight line analysis is saying. There, a new home built by this other family uh, cannot have its view impaired by this structure. Correct. So that sight line analysis showed due to the setback distance of where this extra five feet is, if you made the condition that um, they get rid of that extra five feet, there's no difference in the sight line. You aren't, you aren't saving anything to that property owner. And they're not apartment suites, they're two bedroom suites for the property. Um, okay, how near is the is the nearest uh, two-story home to where this property will be? The the neighbor to the south. This neighbor and here. That, that's how far south? Two hundred and thirty-five feet. Thirty-five feet. Two hundred and thirty-five feet. Is yeah. that what you yes, a very large distance. I have no further questions. Thank you. Okay, Isaiah or Pilar, I have a, a request. Can you please explain to the public how the setback system works? That for every foot of height, there's a certain distance that's required of setback? Yes, so for every one foot of increased height over 25 feet, you have to have a two feet increase for the setback. Let me bring up this diagram. And as you can see, the property is proposing much more than, it would have to be 20 on the sides, 35 on the front and the rear, and these are exceeded by a large margin. So the- Thank you. All right, I have a, a comment if I may, Isaiah, please. The uh, sight line that you're describing answers all the questions, period. Yeah. The other thing is that it will not impede the neighbor's view of the mountains. The mountains are huge. This development, this home is unbelievable. It is a feather in the cap of Rancho Mirage. And to have the doctor and his family build this is a, is a uh, just a, a wonderful, wonderful architectural gem in this city. And it will not impair the mountains. And I, I will just add that back to the day of the Orthodox Church on Monterey that was being built. The outrage was terrible that this huge cathedral is going to block the mountains. Well, when it was built, there was no impediment 
of the mountain and you could hardly even see the, the bell tower of the church. So I think the same thing is here. And I congratulate uh, the doctor and his family for picking Ranch Mirage to build this magnificent estate. Thank you. I have a brief question. In reading the uh, document uh, supporting the construction, I noticed that at the Planning Commission meeting, there was a request for story polls for a couple of the commissioners. Uh, but I didn't see any further discussion as to whether the story poles were work or were installed or not. And I have been told that they were not installed because they would not really show anything uh, negative for the new construction. Is that true? I'll let Jeremy Glime answer that question. Hi, Councilman Kite. So there was discussion at the Planning Commission hearing about the installation of story poles. But after de deliberation between the commissioners, they decided that the exhibits that were provided within the, the packet that you've seen today were more than sufficient to describe that situation and what the potential impacts would be. So they decided against the installation of story poles. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if yes. I may. Uh, I lived uh, for many years within 500 feet of this particular lot. Uh, I went over there again yesterday and walked the area uh, to reacquaint myself. And uh, excellent job, Pilar, of presenting it. I thought the Planning Commission did a great job. The 235 feet separation uh, to the nearest house is enormous. And in no way will the view be impeded based upon this five feet of paraffin for the chimney. Uh, I want to congratulate Dr. Presser. I think it's a magnificent home and will be a great addition uh, to the Clancy Lane area. Uh, Dr. Presser, if it was your goal to build a dream house for you and your wife, I think you far exceeded whatever that dream was. You did a great job. So if there's uh, no other questions or comments uh, of staff or the applicant, uh, this would require a motion by the council. I will make a motion that the city council A, approve the filing and category exemption of environmental impact pursuant to the California Environmental Impact Quality Act, CEQA guidelines 15303 class three and B Approved single family permit case number SFP20 0023 and minor conditions use permit number case CUP20 0008. Subject to conditions of approval and based on the content and findings in this staff report. And I'll, and I'll, second. I'll second that. All right, Christy, we have a motion and a second. Please do the vote. Council Member Kite. Absolutely, yes. Council Member Smotrich? Absolutely, yes, on my part, too. Council Member and congratulations. <laughs> Council Member Townsend? Ditto, ditto, Iris, congratulations, and yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Absolutely, yes. Mayor Hobart? I'll abstain. Um, motion carries 4 0 with Mayor Hobart abstain. Thank you, Christy. Uh, congratulations, happy anniversary. Thank you. We will now move on to item number seven on our agenda. That is resolution number 20, 2021, next in order, approving the electric generation rates for the Ranch Mirage Energy Authority. And Jessica Pulliam uh, will be handling this presentation. Jessica? Hi, good afternoon, Mayor Hobart, members of City Council. The item I will be discussing today is a resolution approving adjusted electric generation rate schedules for the Rancho Mirage Energy Authority for the REMEA. Staff is here today as Southern California Edison 
has recently implemented a rate adjustment. RMEA reviews and adjusts alongside SCE to ensure RMEA customers continue to receive a savings. Overall, as rates have gone down, this proposed resolution will result Oops, excuse me. This proposed resolution will result in a lower electric bills for Rancho Mirage. Since its launch in May 2018, RMEA has provided cleaner energy and saved the community approximately $3 million. We provide direct savings to the community on electric bills by competitively adjusting rates when SCE adjusts their rates as well as putting money directly back into residents' pockets through the Rancher Mirage Solar Rebate Program, which is only available to RMEA participants. At this time, I would like to remind residents and businesses that we are here to help. If you have questions regarding your electric bill or the RMEA program, please do not hesitate to contact us. With that, it is staff's recommendation to adjust RMEA rates to continue to provide overall savings to customers. That concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jessica. Before we go to the council, uh, we will go ahead and open the public hearing on this item. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, now is the time to do so. If you are on Zoom, you would hit the raise hand button. If you are on the telephone, you would hit star nine. Uh, before we go to our remote audience, is there anyone here in person that would like to make a comment? Seeing no one uh, here in person, uh, let's go to our remote audience. Seeing no one in the remote audience either, we will close the public hearing and I will turn this over to the council, Mr. Mayor. Have we had any further discussion? Okay, I have a question of Jessica. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Uh, Jessica, the previous savings to the residents of Ranch Mirage was 5%, and I understand now it will be 1%, is that correct? Uh, compared to SCE rates, that is correct. As SE rate, SCE rates have gone down since last year's adjustment, yet the required exit fees for those opting into a community choice aggregation, such as RMEA is, have continued to go up. So as the rates are adjusted to take the exit fees into consideration when we do our rate setting, the increasing gap from this year has resulted in continued savings for RUMA participants, but less so than previous years. Um, we are actively working with our partners to push for more transparency over these SCE legacy contracts and the resulting exit fees. Is there any chance that given the savings that the city has made over the last three or four years, uh -huh. that we could utilize part of those savings to reduce the residents' uh, cost? I'll defer that question to Isaiah. So um, the long-term success of the program, uh, being that it is a relatively new program, um, it's probably premature to start utilizing reserves in that magnitude. The level of reserves that the program carries is, um, uh, it's, it's somewhere in, in the realm of uh, three and a half million dollars. Uh, the wow. annual energy costs through this program are somewhere around $20 million. Okay, that pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? Any other comments uh, or questions? Nothing I'll for make, me. I'll oh. make a motion, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. I'll make a motion that the city council adopt resolution number 2021 next in order, adjusting electric generation rate schedule for Ranch Mirage Energy Authority Community Aggregation Program. Second. Christy, will you call a vote, please? Of course. Council member Kite? Yes. Council member Smotrich? Yes. Council member Townsend? No. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. We will now move on to our action calendar and we will go to item number eight on our agenda, which is resolution number 2021, next in order, approving and adopting the fiscal year 
2021 mid-year budget adjustments. And this presentation will be handled by Joseph Carpenter, our finance manager. Joseph. Thank you, Mr. Hagerman. Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, today I'll be presenting a summary of the operating budget and highlight the proposed fiscal year 2020-2021 major budget adjustments. The current operating budget adopted by City Council on June 18th, 2020 includes approximately $25.2 million in revenue and $26.3 million in expenditures. Staff is proposing mid-year budget adjustments of $626,000 to operating revenues and approximately $625,000 to operating expenditures, which would increase the projected operating deficit by approximately $1.2 million from $989,000 to $2.2 million. The detail of these proposed budget adjustments will be covered over the next two slides. Staff is requesting to decrease operating revenues $626,000. Staff anticipates the city will receive $1.7 million less in transient occupancy tax, the result of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has caused a prolonged decrease in tourism, and approximately $1.1 million more in development-related fees due to increased building activity, primarily the result of the Del Webb project. Staff is requesting to increase budgeted general fund operating expenditures by approximately $625,000 for the fiscal year. General fund operating expenditures are broken down into three object levels, personnel, which includes salaries and benefits, operations and maintenance, and department equipment. The proposed $200,000 increase in department equipment includes automated license plate readers, the emergency access gate program, and the replacement cost of a street facility fleet vehicle. Detailed on Exhibit A of the resolution in the staff report in pages 8-2 and 8-3, the approximately $425,000 increase in the operations and maintenance object level is comprised of budget adjustments in six divisions. A $45,000 increase in building and safety for plan check services, $35,000 increase in code compliance for short-term rental ordinance enforcement, $162,000 in engineering for inspections and professional technical support, $23,000 increase in facilities and fleet maintenance for COVID-related supplies, $80,000 increase in information services for computer enhancement and maintenance, and an $80,000 increase in planning for general plan maintenance. The general fund summary outlines the impact of the previously approved and proposed general fund budget adjustments. As highlighted in your screen in green, the adopted general fund budget, including both operating and non-operating budgets, had reserve spending of approximately $3.95 million. The budget adjustments discussed today intend to increase fund balance spending by approximately $1.25 million, resulting in a revised estimate of reserve spending of approximately $5.2 million for fiscal year 2020-2021. In addition to the previously discussed general fund budget adjustments, the resolution includes four special revenue fund budget adjustments, totaling approximately $1.98 million. Most of this amount can be attributed to two specific budget adjustments. First, on November 5th, 2020, City Council approved $800,000 for support to Rancho Mirage Resorts for health and safety supplies, service enhancements, and marketing and communications the Small Business Grant Program, and free COVID-19 testing. Lastly, the pandemic caused delays in the city's traffic signal synchronization project, shifting expenses budgeted for the prior fiscal year into this one. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time and consideration this afternoon. Staff is available to answer any questions. Thank you, Joseph. Um, if any member of the public would like to speak on this item, now is the time to do so. If you are participating remotely, you would hit the raise hand button on Zoom or star nine on your telephone to make a comment on this item. Before we go to our remote audience, is there anyone here in person that would like to make a comment on this item? Seeing none, uh, we will go to those that are remote and Brad Anderson, go ahead. 
Hi, yes, uh, Brad Anderson. I live in the city of Rancho Mirage. I'm very, very concerned uh, with these adjustments that you, uh, well, that your statement or uh, presentation or present, well, the person that <laughs> talked about this earlier. I'm sorry. Uh, I know, see, the 35,000 STR ordinance enforcement uh, price adjustment, you know, you cut your funding for that and then you don't have those income anymore, and but you increase cost of enforcement. It, you know, it's just kind of a, it doesn't make sense. And then, of course, most of the public probably isn't aware of all the license plate and the cameras on every intercession now, license plate readers. And I just feel there's no good policy in the city to regulate that type of uh, operation by the city, and it can be misused by a city council, uh, like code compliance is. So I would, uh, I'm very concerned about these allotments. And but again, this is one person's opinion, and um, and uh, anyway, I'm sure you're going to go ahead and adjust it anyway. You have to, but uh, and and you notice you said the uh, COVID testing. Now you received money from Riverside County for that too, so I, I'm 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 not doubting your your budgeting because that's what you do, the city manager, or expertise used to be anyway. So anyway, uh, go ahead and continue. I'm sorry, I'm just going off on a limb. So uh, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Seeing uh, nobody else that wishes to make a comment on this item, we will close public comment, and I will turn this over to the city council. Does anybody have any comment they wish to make before we vote? Yes, Mr. You Mayor, did a great, great job. Uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like to compliment the staff for what they've done to reflect upon the year that we've just gone through with COVID, mm -hmm. uh, w making the adjustments, uh, being generous from a city standpoint as far as the expenditures we've made regarding COVID testing and so forth, and to come through and still have a reserve of approximately $62 million, uh, equal to give or take two years budgets, I think is quite remarkable. So congratulations to all. Um, you know, many times we might get criticized um, uh, that we are patting ourselves on the back. I don't think that's the case at all. I think that uh, our city has shown tremendous fiscal responsibility and at the same time, community obligations to the fullest. So again, staff, great job. Thanks so much. Uh, I think it's a wonderful report and I look forward to approving it. And what's your, is there any other comment? I, I ditto everything that Ted said. Great, wonderfully done, Ted. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, both Charlie. Mr. Carpenter and uh, Ansevon. Great work, and we support it strongly. Um, let's vote, please, Christy. Can you take a vote? Oh, uh, you need a motion, Mr. Mayor. I thought no. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, motion? motion that the City Council adopt Resolution Number 2021 in order. 2021 next in order approving and adopting the fiscal year 2020-2021 mid-year budget adjustments. Okay, is there a motion? I'll second that. Okay. okay, Christy, we have a motion and a second. Please take the vote. Seconding you. Who, who made it? I uh, believe I did. Uh, we have a motion from Mayor Pro Tem Weil, a second from Council Member Smart Rich. There we go. Our city clerk Thank will you. now take the vote. Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smartridge? Yes. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Christy. Uh, we will now move on to item number nine on our agenda, which is the former Rancho Palms Mobile Home Park Replacement Housing Plan. And I will turn this over to our city attorney. Tom, do we need to go in the other?
Uh, Steve, you're on mute, so you need to unmute yourself. So I think our city attorney is having uh, some technical difficulties. Um, if is he in the building? Uh, no, he's participating uh, remotely as well. Um, mm -hmm. So while uh, IT staff works with him, if there's no objection from the council, uh, can we move to item number 10 on the agenda? And then once Steve uh, is ready, we can come back to item number nine. Is that objection is still order. Okay, so uh, while we try to get the city attorney uh, back in the meeting, um, we will move on to item number 10, uh, which is resolution number 2021, next in order, expressing the city council's support for lift to rise regional solutions for the promotion of housing stability and economic mobility. And our housing manager, Marcus Alamon, is gonna give this report. Marcus? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Hobart, City Council, and City staff. As the need for affordable housing in the state of California continues to increase, collaboration amongst municipalities, developers, and investors becomes critical. Live to Rise has become the catalyst to initiating this cross-sector network of partners. Their work brings together community and institutional leaders to solve the underlying causes of poverty and inequality in the region that will lead to a future where all Coachella Valley families are healthy, stable, and thriving. Live to Rise is seeking support for this shared, concrete, and forward-thinking plan and is seeking the city's support by taking the We Will Lift pledge. The We Will Lift Regional Pledge for Housing and Opportunity is an opportunity for the city to signal its support for this regional approach and plan to increasing housing stability and economic mobility. The city of Rancho Mirage recognizes the need for housing in the midst of the state's housing crisis and desires to be proactive in meeting those needs. In this effort, the city will maintain local control, preserving the quality of our commercial development and residential neighborhoods while continuing, it, while continuing its work with local developers as well as Lift to Rise. Staff recommends that the city council adopt resolution number 2021 next in order, authorizing the city manager to pledge support on behalf of the City of Rancho Mirage for Live to Rise's regional solutions for the promotion of housing stability and economic mobility. This concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions you may have. Also joining us via Zoom is Taylor LeBolt Varner from Live to Rise to answer any questions. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, we will now open up public comment on this item. If any member of the public wishes to speak on this item, now is the time to do so. If you are participating remotely, you would hit the raise hand button on Zoom or star nine on your telephone. Before we go to our remote audience, is there anyone here in person that would like to speak on this item? Seeing no one here in person, uh, we will go to our remote audience. And Brad Anderson, go ahead. Hi, yes, Brad Anderson. I live in the city of Ranch Mirage. I, I just found out about this, so I have to comment. I've been following Lift to Rise since, I don't know, about five years ago. I can't remember whenever they popped out of the woodwork. And I would highly recommend that the city uh, at least don't use my name to support this organization and the work that it's doing. Uh, it, I, I've spoken at the D.C. meetings concerning this group, and it has a sweetheart, it's a sweetheart operation, in my opinion, uh, with, uh, of course, the Coachella Valley Association governments and uh, their very close relationship, intimate, you would say. Uh, and, and they've been awarded to the county with uh, no bid contracts for millions and millions and millions of dollars and uh, with no oversight where they're giving cash payments out with... Uh, well, let's just say my opinion is there's very, very little transp uh, transparency with this organization, and they've been more than uh, they've been awarded too many contracts 
without bids uh, for other organizations. And when they did have a bid, they, they they were higher, of course, and they took that bid too. So this is through the uh, CVAG. So my concerns is the uh, credibility of this long-term company and the uh, – no, not long term company, but the long term commitment. And I understand this is just a pledge, uh, but uh, uh, there's underlying. Uh, well, anyway, I have nothing good to say, so I'm done with this topic. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, seeing no one else that wishes to speak on this item, we will close the public comment and I'll turn this over to the council. I say anyone have a comment? Yes, I, I do. Go. If I may say. Wait a second. Richard had his hand up. Oh, first. Richard, go ahead. I'm sorry. You'll go next. Yeah, I say I just had a question regarding some of the comments that were recently made from the individual in the audience. Can you address some of those issues? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, we also have a representative from Lift to Rise here uh, with us as well. So if they want to add to anything, uh, they can jump in. Uh, the the uh, some of the comments were about the uh, county uh, during the pandemic, uh, much like we had our own programs to uh, help our community and the struggles they were facing during the pandemic. Uh, the county had their programs as well. One of them was a rental assistance program. And so uh, the county contracted with Lift to Rise uh, to take the applications and evaluate the applications uh, for that county related program. Um, th this item before us today is um, t taking a step back. Um, California is, is facing um, a housing shortage. Um, and within that housing shortage in general, there's also an extreme lack of affordable housing uh, that's being built and has been a lack of affordable housing that has been built over the past 10 years. You know, and, and some of the, the fallout of eliminating redevelopment agencies was that's really how agencies incentivized and built affordable housing. Uh, and when the state to, um, took redevelopment agencies away, there was no replacement funding for affordable housing. So it's been a real struggle to subsidize the affordable housing industry. Uh, and without a subsidy, it, you know, it's very difficult to build and make a project affordable. So uh, this pledge before you today is um, lift to rise. Um, their goal is to actually build affordable housing and to pool resources and go to the place in the valley where that project can actually be built. So it's more of a regional approach. So in, instead of things being so siloed um, or uh, you know city by city uh, or county by itself, the, the goal of Lift, Lift to Rise uh, is to uh, basically take their knowledge of all the jurisdictions of where could you have affordable housing, what are the affordable housing policies within each city. They take all that information and then they pool resources and say, where can we go build a project right now? Uh, and where can we actually get affordable housing? Uh, so this is more of um, a, a regional approach to trying to solve this very difficult problem. And you know, using Rancho Mirage as the example, when we had a redevelopment agency, you know, we built and operated affordable housing. We still own those four affordable housing projects today. However, without the funding uh, that we received for that purpose from the redevelopment agencies, we're struggling like every other jurisdiction to find a way to actually get affordable housing to be built. So Lift Arise is an organization that is trying to tackle this problem of how do we actually get things built here in the valley that benefit everybody? Uh, and you know, it doesn't matter where the housing unit is developed, it benefits the valley. Uh, and so that's the point of this pledge. Um, it is, um, Lift Arise has done a lot of work at the staff level, which each of the cities, uh, this very same pledge mm -hmm. is making its way around the valley and I would anticipate that the county's already obviously uh, approved it. 
Uh, I think five other cities have approved it, and we are of the four that are having our councils consider it. I would anticipate that every Valley City will sign off on this pledge. This has nothing to do with homelessness housing, right? No, this has nothing to do with um, transitional housing or the CVAG Housing First program. Okay. This, this has to do with affordable housing. And let me just say that we do discuss that as CVAG's homeless, and uh, I am aware of it. And I supported the city of Rancho Mirage, do support it also. It's an important thing. And Sacramento is also looking to funding it. Uh, it's very important. It's not going to go away. And, and, and there's my comment. And, and Isaiah added everything uh, and cleared it up. Thank you. We, we do have the rep from Lift to Rise, Taylor. Uh, sorry, I didn't see your hand raised there for a second. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, uh, good afternoon, um, Honorable Mayor and um, Council Members. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Um, I'm here representing not only Live to Rise, the backbone organization, but the 50 plus partners um, that have come together around this action plan. Um, those partners include, um, you know, working with um, staff at the city of Ranch Mirage in um, all nine cities um, and the county. Um, I uh, would offer that um, we have been trusted to disperse um, over $50 million in rental assistance program um, funding to residents in the Coachella Valley. Um, and that is all um, very transparent and um, all that information is uh, readily available. I'd be happy to pass along that information. Um, but again, we are not a singular organization, but a collection of partners that are organizing to to envision what can be what can happen in the Coachella Valley when we work together, um, and so we're uh, excited to be here. Um, really excited to work uh, alongside um, City of Ranch Mirage staff and um, with you as the council um, again to align uh, what we're doing um, to create a future where all Coachella Valley families can thrive. Um, and I am here to answer any questions, and um, I really appreciate the opportunity to to be here today and for um, our, our pledge to be considered. Thank you, Taylor. Okay, Isaiah, yeah. no one else has any questions. I do have a couple. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, uh, it sounds like an incredible project, uh, but on page 10-1, uh, it mentions on um, the one, two, three, third paragraph down. However, as the state of California mandates communities to build more housing units, there are efforts to take local control and review from cities in the development of housing. So uh, as one of my questions, how do we end up uh, having some sense of control over the projects that will be built? And then uh, on the page 10-4, it says Lift to Rise seeks to radically change the trajectory of opportunity in the affordable, affordability in the Coachella Valley. Okay, so it's transforming our community into a place for opportunity and change. How does, when radically change uh, feed into this? And then also on page 10-8, uh, the one, two, three, four, whereas down, uh, California's communities build more housing units is making efforts to take control. So it's mentioned again, as far as being control of the developments. And then when you go down to uh, one of the uh, bullet marks, the first one says advancing a community valued pipeline of investable projects that will result in 2000 units of affordable housing in the next two years. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the 2,000 units, uh, do we have an indication of how many units Rancho Mirage itself will be responsible for providing? So um, let me take that piece by piece. So okay. the, the, the first comment about the state removing local control, we've seen that already. Um, yes. We started to see it with the ADU, the accessory dwelling unit, where... Uh, those used to require council approval and a state law came in and said, no, as long as it meets certain provisions, 
you're required to approve that at the staff level because we want housing. So with affordable housing, um, outside of um, a direct funding source to local governments to do what we used to do, um, the state's approach to date has been to uh, remove our local rules um, as a way to incentivize people to be able to build affordable housing. Um, so each year uh, there are many, 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 many bills uh, that are considered by the state and a lot of them have to do with housing and removing local control. You know, there, there's, a, there's a bill being introduced this year that says if you own a municipal golf course and you don't have the room to meet your, or the available land to meet your housing obligations, you're required to convert that municipal golf course into affordable housing. Obviously that's not law yet, but that's just one example of bills each year that get introduced around housing. So the state's approach has not been to provide a funding source for local governments to help subsidize the development of affordable housing. Their approach to date has been to come up with rules like that where they can avoid the local level. So Lift to Rise is an organization that um, wants to come in with this regional approach. And, you know, Funding is very limited when it comes to affordable housing. And by being able to pool resources, they're able to go and be more competitive with outside dollars. So really at the end of the day, you know, one of the goals of Lift to Rise is to go leverage more outside funding so that we can actually start getting traction here in the Coachella Valley. So the goal of 2,000 homes, that's not... Um, you know, our arena numbers that are coming uh, from the state and SCAG. You know, obviously through the state and updating our housing element, we will have as a jurisdiction uh, the new affordable housing units that we will have to meet at the local level. Um, but that flows through, you know, our housing element, and it's through a combination of uh, zoning and planning for our community. And so that housing element will still flow through, obviously, the city council. Um, if a project is going to be developed and it happens to be in Rancho Mirage, that project's going to flow through the entitlement process like any other project would. Okay. Well, thank you for answering that. And so when it's on page 10-4 where it talks about Live to Rise seeks to radically change the trajectory could you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, they want to. Or, uh, or maybe the person from uh, Rice, Lifted Rice might be able to answer that. Uh, sure. Uh, I'll answer briefly, and then if Taylor wants to add anything. Um, right now, you know, affordable housing isn't uh, developing as fast as it should. So that's what they mean. They want to go and uh, pool resources and be more competitive uh, for the funding that is available outside the area. Uh, there are some very big dollars, uh, but you have to show certain things in order to be eligible. So as an example, if the city of Rancho Mirage tried to go get one of those by itself, we would not be successful, as would you know, several other cities within the Coachella Valley. So this regional approach is really to try to change our competitiveness, go get those outside dollars, focus from a region on the projects that we're presenting to be more competitive. And uh, Taylor, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm wondering if um, Heather Vicona um, can actually take this one. She is raising her hand. Yeah, sure, go ahead, Heather. Thank you, and thank you, council members. Um, we are really grateful for, um, for the time that you're spending discussing this. Um, Council mem Member Smotrich, I would just offer that the language of wanting to um, radically shift the trajectory is really um, the way that we frame talking about how to address the significant number of residents in the Coachella Valley 
who are rent burdened. So before COVID-19, two out of three households in the Coachella Valley were severely cost burdened. And when we talk about wanting to shift the trajectory, we're working towards a future um, where two out of three renters in the Coachella Valley um, are not waking up at three o'clock in the morning stressed out about how they're gonna pay their rent. And I know that all of you know, especially in the time of COVID-19, um, that's an, an incredible burden for folks. We're operating the rental assistance program on behalf of the county and serving so many residents in Rancho Mirage. And we see a high level of rent burden in the city as well. So it's really about um, imagining and persisting towards a future um, where folks are able to live in housing they can afford. Okay, that sounds terrific. And I notice on page 10-6, uh, pledge partner contributions uh, listed government agencies, developers, funders, banks, foundations, private sector, other CBOs and residents. Uh, how do you try to include or have you already been able to include the funders with the banks and foundations and the residents? How does how does that those those two categories come into play, and have they already stepped up to the plate to be partners? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. So to date, um, we've raised more than a million dollars for the operations of the Housing Catalyst Fund. Um, which will launch um, at the end of this month. Um, and a, actually a huge majority of those funds were raised um, from bank foundations um, who contribute to our work. We work with a lot of banks who are able to contribute resources through their CRA. Um, so their C uh, Community Reinvestment Act footprint in the Coachella Valley. So banks have an obligation to make CRA investments. Um, we are, uh, before this year, we were 95% funded um, by philanthropy, national philanthropy. So 95% of our funding before this year came from outside of the Coachella Valley. Um, I think all, all members know that we're operating um, a very large uh, rental assistance effort that's now um, near a $90 million countywide effort. So um, of course, uh, numbers are skewed this year because we are responsible for um, a significant amount of federal funding. Um, but yes, we engage philanthropy, we engage banks, we engage uh, community residents. Um, and that's really what's led to us driving this effort. Okay, thank you for answering all my questions. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. I say at some point, is this organization going to ask for funding from the city? Can you hear us, Isaiah? Hi, Councilman Kai. This is Jeremy. I can take that. So at this point, they're just trying to collect resources and see what opportunities might be available. So um, as of right now, it's just trying to get all the communities on board and the cities on board to kind of move toward this collective um, push or um, just response to housing. So nothing's been asked at this point. Okay. Because I will say that uh, they're just really trying, as uh, was just said, to make sure that everybody in the Coachella Valley, the nine cities, are on board with this and looking forward to trying to be a participant in solving this uh, homeless situation and also affordable housing. Isaiah, where do we go from here? Uh, so uh, we are asking uh, for a resolution to be approved. So that would require a motion by the council. Okay, I'll make that motion. Um, I move that the city council adopt resolution number 2021 next in order, expressing the city council's support for Lift to Rise's regional solutions for the promotion of housing stability and economic mobility. Second. All right, Christy, we have a motion and a second. Please take the vote. Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Christy. Uh, thank you, Heather and Taylor, for uh, being here today to answer the questions. Uh, we will now move back. Uh, to item number nine on our agenda, 
which is the former Rancho Palms Mobile Home Park Replacement Housing Plan. And we now have our city attorney uh, here. So Steve, I'll turn this over to you for the report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hagerman. Um, you know, when it comes my turn to be vaccinated, I think I was gonna take my computer in because I've been having issues, but I think it already has a virus. So they're gonna to have to come up with a cure. So in any event, sorry about that malfunction there. Um, so this item that I'm about ready to discuss, I think that the last item was actually a good lead in to it and gave me some ideas about some other issues to kind of bring up that are related to uh, the issue of affordable housing. Now we've all heard the expression that no good deed goes unpunished. We're all very familiar with that. And I gotta tell you, after uh, listening to what we just discussed, it just reminded me that, you know, that that applies, no, no place does that apply any better than to the situation of affordable housing in the Sea of Ranch Barrage. And I say that because uh, one of the things that the general public, a lot of people don't realize is how honorable and how noble that the city council has been with respect to providing affordable housing and providing affordable housing, even with the limited resources that we have available for affordable housing. As Mr. Hageman um, mentioned earlier, there was a time before the demise of our redevelopment law and our redevelopment agencies, we had a steady um, revenue source coming into all cities in California and had redevelopment agencies in place that provided a source of revenue for affordable housing. And that came in the um, form of a 20% set-aside fund. And that 20% set-aside set aside fund came from the tax revenue, the tax increment revenue that was raised by redevelopment. And so 20% of that money was set aside for affordable housing. So what did the city of Ranch and Raj do and the city council do as the housing authority board? I gotta tell you, 30, uh, nearly 30 years in this business dealing with affordable housing, I gotta say that this city council, and this housing authority board, which are the same, have done a tremendous job, a very noble and honorable job in assuring that they can provide the maximum affordable housing that they could with the resources that we have. And they continue to do that to this day. So now we're operating without any revenue sources coming in um, to our affordable housing fund, but we still maintain affordable housing in Ranch Mirage, unlike any other city I gotta tell you in this valley, if not in the entire state of California on a per capita basis. You know, currently we provide housing, affordable housing to um, probably 225 seniors. Um, a lot of them would have absolutely no place to go. A significant portion of them would probably be homeless, but for the responsible, the responsible actions that this council has taken to not only buy the land, but to actually construct these projects, to maintain it, to operate it, and to manage it. Even after we've lost our source of affordable funding, affordable housing funding. So currently we do, uh, you know, Mr. Hageman um, referred to our four senior housing projects. You know, as, as I don't, I'm not sure, I'm gonna, just talk about this just for basically for the public's sake, so the public knows that this council is really serious about the their you know about providing affordable housing to people who need affordable housing. So we currently have four senior projects on uh, Parkview Villas that has about 82 units. It has a base rent that starts at $338 a month. Now, where else are you gonna get a place for $338 a month? We have San Jacinto Villas. There's 82 units there. The base rentals are much larger, newer units. The base rent there is 568 a month. Santa Rosa Villas, we had 33 units with the base rent of 595 a month. And we have Whispering Waters, which provides 29 units at a base rent of $332 a month. So in addition to what the City Council and Housing Authority Board has provided with respect to senior affordable housing, we've also, the city has also collaborated with the private sector. Um, and right now we have at least four complexes out there who provide affordable housing through support by 
the Ranch Mirage Housing Authority and the City Council. We have Las Colinas, it's an apartment complex that provides 84 affordable units. We have Mission Shores where we have 21 of the houses that are subject to affordability covenants for moderate income families. We have Village Mirage that provides 98 affordable units. And that, that project was a project that uh, participates in the Section 8 certificate program. And they couldn't do that, but with the, the assistance and sponsorship of the City of Ranch Mirage and the Ranch Mirage Housing Authority. And finally, we have the Ranch Mirage Resorts, which provides 44 units that we have resale restrictions on them to ensure that they are maintained as part of our inventory for moderate income families. And on top of that, the City Council has also been very proactive in protecting the affordability opportunities that are provided by our mobile home rent control ordinance. Now, granted that this ordinance was adopted by the voters back in the 80s, but the City Council has been very, very uh, proactive in making sure that those rents are protected and maintained by law to be affordable to our, the residents of the city. So the city has a long history and this city council continues in its efforts, its sincere and honorable efforts to maintain affordable housing in the city of Ranch Mirage. And that's something that we don't hear a lot about because I never hear anyone on this council tout how much we're doing and on, on that end with respect to um, you know, doing what we have to do uh, for a city our size uh, population wise with respect to providing affordable housing and we don't just limit affordable housing opportunities to people who live here when we establish affordable housing uh, opportunities we do it for anyone who's eligible to apply regardless of where they live so I just wanted to put that out there um, and the other thing I'd like to mention too is that there was some reference to the this this uh, regional housing needs so every you know, we're on this cycle along with every other city in California that um, has some regional government, such as the Southern California Association of Governments, that determine um, the allocation, the allocations that are assigned to each jurisdiction with respect to the, the amount of housing they need to provide. And so we're assigned these numbers. And I gotta say that based on the latest numbers that I've seen, I think that the city has done a tremendous effort in keeping up with the pace of it. And that's really challenging to do, but I think that the city has done a tremendous job in doing that. And I think it's done a lot better job than a lot of other cities, not only in the Valley, but also in cities throughout the state of California. So with that said, that's just all background to the fun stuff I wanna talk about right now. Um, I, I, I know that all of you have read the treatise that I wrote as a staff report that talks about the history of the Rancho Palms Mobile Home Park, because we've lived with that history for a while. And so what I'd like to do is just kind of step back in time just a little bit to kind of give you give everybody an idea of why we're here today and how we got here without getting into all the nitty gritty. But uh, back in 2000, I think it was about 2009, and this was be at the time that we still have all this revenue coming in for um, affordable housing. At that time, the city council and the housing authority board made a determination based on recommendations of staff that it was critical to save the affordable housing opportunities that were being offered under our mobile home rent control ordinance in Rancho, uh, Rancho Palms Mobile Home Park because we had learned that the owner of the park at that time was planning on shutting down the park, closing the park, and had plans to possibly do a subdivision there or do condominiums. But because of the interest, the council's interest in maintaining that affordability opportunity for residents, it decided to buy the park. And it ended up buying the park, and I say buy the park, it ended up buying the land upon which the mobile home coaches were situated upon, and it decided to go forward and negotiate with each of the owners of each of those mobile home coaches to buy their units. And at the time that they we negotiated these sales, um, they were very they were great sales. You know, everybody was happy. All the homeowners were happy because they all knew that they were getting a lot more. I had to a lot more 
than what those units were worth. And everybody knew that at the time. And so we were successful at the time in acquiring every unit in that park with the understanding and with the knowledge that we all knew, the housing authority knew and the city council knew that we would have to use that money that we used to purchase the park and purchase those units to provide replacement housing. Well, the problem that came up at the time was that um, although we were able to purchase all the units, we had one holdout. And that one holdout held out for about six years. So we were operating a park, spending all this money for one household, one single household. And this person ended up suing the city and suing the housing authority and made all these horrible allegations about how the city was not fulfilling its duties in providing affordable housing. Well, I got to say that in the end, what was determined was none of that really happened. None of that really existed. But in an effort to just to get resolved the litigation, um, it was based on my recommendation. I had recommended the city council that, you know what, let's go ahead and settle this case. Let's give them, you know, something to make them go away. But in addition to that, we are also going to, you know, confirm our commitment, our legal obligation to replace that housing. And so part of the settlement agreement that we reached in mediation was that, uh, that the city council would basically adopt a housing replacement plan that would require us to replace 126 units of affordable housing. And we would, in, within two years of the time that we signed the settlement agreement, which would be April, April 12, 2021, we would issue a building permit that would commence the construction of those housing units. So after discussing this issue with staff, it made, it made sense, total sense, just to retain ownership of the park because the city continues to retain ownership, the housing authority continues to retain ownership of the park land. Currently, it's vacated. And so that, it makes just entire good sense to put our housing there. So at this, at this point, what's being recommended is that the housing authority and the city council adopt this housing plan that commits that land to the construction of uh, hundred the, the number of replacement housing that we are going to provide there. When did I, when did I go to go blank on that number? 126 units? Yeah. And so yeah, that's yeah. what the proposal is. So we're recommending, I'm recommending that city council and housing authority of board adopt this, uh, this replacement plan. And it's a plan that simply commits the city and commits the housing authority to using that as a location of the place where we would eventually um, provide 126 units of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And this affordable housing is going to be affordable housing that's going to be available not only to seniors, but also to families as well. That just means people with children at, that are going to be allowed to um, apply to uh, move into that housing. Eve, let, let me ask you a question right here. When you say eventually, let me use the word eventually. How eventually are you talking about? Five years, two years, two months? When will the city of Ranch Mirage ever have the funds to build 126 homes on that property. And the next question is affordable. Everybody keeps throwing out affordable. What is affordable? Is affordable 300,000 for a two bedroom uh, 900 square foot house or $245 a square foot? Where are these prices and what is the timeline that you are looking at? Okay, I should, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. There is no timeline. There is no timeline. The, the settlement agreement simply provides that we have to have a plan adopted and that we have to issue a building permit before April, April 12, 2021. I mean, theoretically and technically, um, if we find a better place to put this housing, we can have the city council can propose or the staff can propose that the city council or housing authority adopt a different plan. But right Let now- Let me say like, this. Steve, also, in what you wrote, and I read it all through twice, this seems like the big hang-up with all of this affordable housing everywhere, just now Ranch Mirage, <clears throat> is that no developer will touch it with a 10-foot pole 
because they can't build it for whatever that affordable housing square foot price is and make any money. So it seems like it's always going to go back to the city, including Ranch Mirage, to foot this bill. And to me, 126 homes and developing that has to be worth millions of dollars. And then what happens down the line with, well, there is no, there is, it's an open end thing, Charlie. It's too loose, Steve. What you said, Charlie, is true. And that's one of the reasons in the staff report we indicated, uh, we've acknowledged the efforts of staff and the efforts of the city in general to reach out to developers. There were no, currently, under the current situation, there's no interest in building affordable housing by most developers. At one time there was, and, that, and, and during that time, that was a time where we had this, this source of revenue that used to come in, the 20% set aside. That's gonna be the challenge. Right now, I'm simply focused on fulfilling the duties that are set forth in the settlement agreement by just committing that we have a plan to replace that housing and that there, we're in a position to issuing a building permit. The building permit is not necessarily to build an actual house. We can issue a building permit to, you know, uh, or even demolition permits to clear the land because we need to clear some of that land right now. I read um, that. Because we have some old foundations in there. Yeah. So this, this doesn't mean that we are actually going to start building houses tomorrow or any time soon. This, the action that you're, that I'm suggesting that you take tonight is to approve a plan that just, that says that we're going to maintain ownership of this land. So we don't have to go out and buy any new land. There's no obligation to build this land because there's no source of funding anymore. And right, that's let me ask another this, reason. I, I get what you're saying. Excuse me for interrupting. However, so you're saying that for us to approve this, this open-ended uh, giving permits and that this would go through a court would agree with this down the line, nope. like in and out burger or SDRs or anything else that we're dealing with. And everybody would accept this loosey goosey, whatever you want to build it guys, it's okay with us. This is our project. This is a housing authority project. But it's not this answering the question of the legal thing that we started with when we developed or supposedly we're going to develop and buy those coaches and build on that. It's still there. Oh, How are you going to answer yeah, that? That's, you know what? There's always that risk. There's Thank always you. that risk. Yes. Here we go with a risk. Yes. Okay. There's always that risk. You know, right now we're in a position of controlling that property. We would not, you know, there's no suggestion, there's no recommendation that we sell that land or that we bring in a private developer. We have total control of that land right now. And on the issue of what constitutes affordable housing, affordable housing is all, all built around income. So there's, these, there's, so there's these different levels of income that are tied to a certain percentage of the medium income. And so uh, we have like very, very, very low, very low, low and moderate. And those are incomes that we're looking at. And so we have to tie those incomes, you know, those, those uh, incomes to the price of the housing. Now, there's Steve, no like Steve, I, Steve, I get everything you're saying. I got it. The thing that I'm still going back to is, is that open end at the end of when are you going to do, you are saying that no one is going to question us about when you intend to develop these acres and build these, whatever it is, affordable housing, we can get away with that? No, I'm not saying that. What are I'm you just saying? saying right now that we have an obligation to adopt a plan that demonstrates that we have a place. We have intent. Affordable. Yes. Right? We have intent. Yes. yes. But by adopting it, it's, it signifies or memorializes your formal intent. You know, I didn't want to risk just saying, okay, your honor, we issued a building permit, you know, because I knew that we all know that we have the land there. We all know, we know from the very beginning, we had a legal obligation to replace that housing Absolutely. because we used the housing authority money. So we're not doing anything different at this point. We're just right now uh, suggesting that we take formal action to identify that place as a place that we own, the housing authority owns, and, so, and as a place that could accommodate the 126 affordable housing units. 
and that we're in a position right now of being able to issue a building permit to commence construction of the project itself. There's Not necessarily no housing, line. but the project. There's no timeline. Okay. No Although we, timeline. Have to, we, have to issue, we have to issue the building permit by April 12th, 2021. And, and how long will we have to put a shovel in the ground to start building well, those homes? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna be putting a shovel in the ground fairly soon to start construction of a community that will um, you know, provide a place for those house, that housing to be built. Okay, Steve, I have a question also, because on page, are you finished, Charlie? You know, I have one, one more thing, Iris. All right, you. go ahead. And on page 93, third paragraph, the wording says, project area, the development of the project, provide participation by owners or tenants. Does this mean the people will build and people can come in and buy these or are they leasing oh, it? What? That's, that's gonna be up to the housing authority to determine whether or not you wanna even build stick housing or whether you wanna do manufacturer housing, whether you want to rent it out or okay. whether you want to sell the units, whether you wanna subdivide the property whether you even want to sell the project to a developer. Um, so all those, those are all decisions that are going to be within the control of the um, Housing Authority Board and City which Council. Is, which is us. Which is you. Is us. Yeah, so all of you. Ba basically, what it says here is and or. That's not true then. It's either hit one, like you just read Oh, no, you can, you can do a combination. You might be able to sell some and rent some. Okay. I yeah, there's, a lot, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of flexibility. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, the, reason why, the reason why there was this two-year lag was basically to determine whether or not there was any interest by the private sector. I didn't anticipate there would be, and that's been pretty much confirmed through, you know, through the last two years. That even though everything we've done to Section 19, all the infrastructure that the city you know, helped us assist getting in there, we still haven't, we don't have a line of developers wanting to come in to build. No, I know, yeah, housing. I know, I, believe me, I know, I yeah. know that. And also yeah. that's why the question cannot be answered to, what is affordable per square foot? You can't that's answer correct. that because no, you can't it could be this that. development, it could be mobile homes, I got it. It has, I, yeah, it has to be affordable to um, certain people, to certain um, family incomes, certain sectors of family income, the very low, very, very low, very low, and moderate and it also has to be skewed to the people that we bought their their coaches from to be the first ones to come in yeah. and have a crack yeah they have the right to first refusal now whether or not they're going to want to move from wherever they move to uh it's my understanding i think that some of them may have bought some units that's all we have to do is just offer it all right iris Okay, thank you, Charlie. I just want to remind the Steve, council I'm, I'm, that we still have public comment to do. Okay. Oh, go. So, all right. So, go ahead with public comments. Are you done with your report, Steve? Yes. Okay. Um, so, at this point, uh, we will now open up the public comment on this item. If any member of the public wishes to speak, now is the time to do so. If you are participating remotely, you would hit the raise hand button on Zoom or star nine on your telephone. Before we go to our remote audience, is there anyone here in person that would like to speak on this item? Seeing no one here in person, let's go to our remote audience. Seeing no one that has indicated they wish to speak on this item, we will close the public comment and uh, go ahead, Council. Okay, thank you, Isaiah. All right, Steve, on page 9-2 in the fourth paragraph, the last couple of uh, lines, it says, the private sector has shown little interest in applying for entitlements and or constructing, operating, maintaining, and managing affordable housing in the city of Rancho Mirage. And that seems to be something that is uh, very much um, uh, the, the situation throughout. Uh, Things seem to be put on on the back burner for a lot of these builders, but in our agreement, our settlement agreement, and I know Charlie asked about whether or not there was a timeline 
uh, where we had to start or someone had to start doing some kind of construction or the application of housing on that property. And if no one comes forward, is there a timeline when the city will be required to take on the project and do the building ourselves? Well, right now we're in a situation where we have a lot of old foundations there. And this is a discussion I've had with staff that at this point it would be sufficient to issue permits to start removing some of those foundations. So at least the property will be clear in the event at some time in the future, we want to actually start building the housing, we, you know, that the property will be cleared. So at this point, we're in a position of clearing the property and getting it prepared. Now the settlement agreement- Okay, but in the not, settlement yeah. agreement, but in the settlement agreement, if no one comes forward in a certain length of time, is it going to be incumbent upon the city council to take on the project ourselves so that we can provide the affordable housing at a variety of levels, whether it's low, very low, extremely low, or moderate? No, what is our responsibility no. going to be in, in a, in a uh, year or two or three or four? Or so can, we just, sit, yeah, can we just sit on the property and wait till a developer comes along, or do we start pursuing the idea of selling off some of the property and enhancing our ability to provide some kind of affordable housing? Yes, eventually, and there is no timeline. You know, one of the things that we need is just a, we just need a plan, and we need a memorialized plan that we do have a place right now where we can construct it, but there is no obligation that we actually build these, these house, the housing anytime soon. We just have to build with the issue of building permit by April 12th of 2021 that is connected with the commencement of the construction of these units. Now, constructing a complex that includes these replacement housing units includes a lot of work. It includes clearing the property, it includes building walls, it includes building streets, it includes putting in the infrastructure such as electricity and water and all the other utilities to prep the property. You know, so at this point, if we end up issuing building permits to, you know, construct a wall to secure the area or to issue ministry, other ministerial permits to remove foundations, old foundations, we'll have the property prepped for construction of these units. Now, if the Housing Authority Board, uh, if we find a developer in the meantime that says, you know what, I'll tell you what, I will trade that property and I will build those housing units over there on the other side of town, and that's something that's palatable to the Housing Authority Board, we'll still be within our, you know, we'll still be within the terms of the settlement agreement. Well, we basically, just have Steve, to have what we're saying, Steve, we're saying, that if okay, we so, approve this, okay, we're but doing you this. Go ahead. When you mention entitlements or prepping uh, procedures, are we going to be responsible if we cannot find a developer in a four-year period or five-year period? Will we be responsible for putting in electricity and uh, anything else that might be needed as a preparation for a, a developer to come in? My guess is the settlement agreement. My guess is the answer is probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why, you know, that's why it was important. Somehow things change. Council. We will be at the bottom of the barrel and we'll be the ones that end up paying for all the things that no builder would do. Thank you, Dana. Reason. That's where yeah. I'm going. Right. What, what are the catchphrases that's built into this? If we, if we approve this, Steve, it's just giving the uh, the uh, authority to continue going on and doing what you have in the recommendations. Until yeah. they put up a stop sign that says, well, okay, got it. Yeah. moving backwards is now done. You have to put up money. Well, keep hey, in Dana, mind. Not, the, Dana, are, are, you, are, you, are, are you okay with agreeing to this or do you think we should check into this and have more discussion in this, either with a subcommittee or something? Because there's too many little dingle dangles laying out here. I don't know. What do you think? I think it would be interesting for Steve to 
take today's conversation, go to his office and answer his best guess, if that's what it is, his best guess is what the answer is to these things. Because if we have to put up millions of dollars at some point, we are going to be a different uh, ranch and lodge than we talked about a couple hours ago. I exactly. appreciate that, Dana, we, and that's we why I'm have... doing this, Steve. I think that I'm going to ask Dana to, to uh, make a motion to do just that. Well, okay. Remember, we have a deadline. But we have a timeline. I know, I know you've got a deadline. We have a legal obligation to replace that housing, regardless. I get it. But the only thing we I'm saying is obligation. there's just, it's just too, there's not enough in here, like I'm saying, what Dana's saying, what Iris is saying, that needs to be a little more tightened up so that we're not hilt is being obligated down the road to be putting up a five or ten million dollar 126 homes for people it's well, just well not we, fair for me but we also need to know exactly what the settlement agreement uh guarantees as part of our fulfilling our duties yes that's that's what it is that's what it is that's what it is we have to make a commitment to replace that housing which we legally are obligated to do and the other, the other factor is that we just have to issue a building permit. That's it. All right, That's let me just all say it this. is. Can we building go back permit to for how many saying? houses? 126. 126, Dana. We Can have we to issue back? a building permit. And we don't find a developer that's willing to take it on. Now, what happens then? Dana, by taking the action tonight, you fulfill your legal obligations under the settlement agreement. That, that can change tomorrow. Right, because you list. because you have total control of that property. The the you good thing want, the good situation want, because you, the, you own we own the land. We own that land. Steve, yeah, let me ask you a question. Third party. Steve, right. you used the date of April second, correct? April twelfth. Where did that come from? That Another, was two years after the execution of the settlement agreement. So that we, we have a deadline of April 2nd of this? No, this April 12th, 2021. This is something that we've discussed, but I don't want to, we can't discuss this in open session. Well, that, that's my concern. That a lot of what, what I'm hearing for the, for the first time is this deadline that we're making decisions now predicated on this April date. But you're not making decisions on let me tell you, this, you're just adopting a plan. This plan can change. We can have a developer come forward and say, listen, I will build a hundred and um, the, the replacement unit for me, for you, provided that you pay for it. We have an obligation. That money that we made, we have not, we can't use that money and put it in general fund. We can't use it for any other purpose but for replacement housing. Uh, That's I why I never understood during the context of the litigation. I thought, why is that an issue? That's something we have to do anyway. I understand. I don't want to get into this too deep, but the previous discussions we've had without disclosing too much is that uh, we've had a representation that we can go out and buy a couple of units anywhere. Yes, yes. yes Ted. Yes, and, you can do that too. And, and solve this issue yes. and not be faced with a major obligation of 100 and, what, 126 oh. units. In we would have that obligation anyway. We, now, whether, we can scatter them around town. We can provide assistance. We can, we can bring in units that are currently not in the affordable housing context and bring them in. But what if I'm that's saying what you is, want to spend the money, we can do it that way. For example, I mean, if we bought two units to resolve the legal issue, we're not faced with the same, frankly, a threat uh, that we're facing. I understand we have to develop this property, but it seems to me that, that by, by buying a couple of units, you've represented before that that will resolve the issue. Yes, as long as we get up to 126 eventually. We can go out and buy an apartment complex that's subject to market rates. We can buy and provide assistance and provide you assistance to it. And if they if they agree, if we agree, if they agree to uh, uh, to attach the affordability covenants to keep them affordable, if there's 20 in them, 26 of them in there, then we have 100 more to go out and attract. 
What if there's so two? Not, or two, then we have 124. All right, if you bought two, wouldn't that resolve this issue? No. I mean, no, 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 no. no. We it still resolve, have to. It, it would resolve the issuance of the building permit issue. So there's two components here. We have to we have to have a plan to do replacement house. We are legally obligated. We have always been legally obligated I to understand. provide that replacement housing. Right. The second component is we have to issue a building permit toward the uh, meeting that uh, the objectives of that plan. Hmm. So yes, if we had a plan to go out there and convert 126 market rate units into affordable housing units, which means that we have to provide some sort of assistance. We have to take that money that we made and provide some sort of assistance. Then they agreed that it comes with affordability covenants. Then good, we got one. We do it for another one, we got another one. But okay, it has to be part so, of a plan. So even if we were to sell this piece of property and seek to purchase 126 other units around our city, mm -hmm. we would still be oh. having to have the owners agree to this affordability yeah. covenant. Correct. Correct. And uh, how many, how many uh, apartment building owners do you think would be oh, willing? Oh, there's not. That's no. why we, that's not. Why we no. come back yeah. with this. That's, that's the why problem. We come back so we this. end up yes. coming back to this piece of property. That's correct. Let, let, let me ask this, everybody. Uh, Steve, on that date, can you get an extension on that date first? First, And the second thing is, I think there are so many but loose yeah. ends that we have all asked about and are not that comfortable with moving forward with this so that we can, so that you, you can resolve it and put us at peace that we're doing the right thing and what our obligations are in the future. Yeah. So, Can you do that? I so, can tell you we've exhausted Steve. all our efforts. Even in the even in the um, general plan update, the annual update that we that was approved by the planning commission, in there it states we have not gotten any interest from the private sector to be involved with anything that has to do with affordable housing. Steve, that's just the fact. And so this is like our. This is all we have available as a tool. Steve. And again, the market may change and we may have people flood us with, oh, you know, we want to come in and help you on meeting that, um, that plan to replace 126 units. They can be a unit here, a unit there, an apartment complex there, or a subdivision there. And then well, I think, that I, time, Steve, I think can, that's where Iris was going, saying if we bought two here and one there where Ted was going, does right. that negate the uh, situation of developing the 126 units in total, in totem? D can we do oh, it no. piece by piece? No. No. Yes, you can do it piece by piece, but you still got to get to that 126 number somehow. It's, we a, it's are the number of units. Steve. We are obligated to provide 126 units no matter what. Period. Correct. Period. That's correct. Steve. And they have to be in the city. Yes. 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 Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So let me add something to the discussion here. Please, please do. <laughs> so this site has sat in its current condition for many years. Uh, we often get complaints from the surrounding neighborhood on the condition of this site. This uh, recommendation from the city attorney is a starting point only. We, what this allows city staff and the city attorney to do is have a starting point to start to plan on how we're going to meet the city's legal obligation to replace 126 units. Obviously, if we had our RDA and the 20% set aside, this would be a very easy task because we would have the funding source to do that. Today, the world is very different. So we aren't committing to the city building 126 units or buying 126 units, which we financially probably couldn't do anyways. This plan or this recommendation will allow us to start the process. 
it also will allow us to issue a building permit to demolish the site and take care of some of the uh, neighborhood issues. At the same time, a clean site is easier to develop for a potential developer than one in its current condition. So I don't believe that this is the end of the conversations on this uh, plan. But what this would allow us to do is start to work towards the goal of satisfying the city's legal obligation to replace these 126 units. So from a staff perspective, uh, you know, this is just the start of probably many alternatives that are potentially at the city's disposal. Being that we own the land, uh, we also have a lot of control with the ownership of that land. So I recognize that there are still many questions, um, but at the end of the day, I think what the city attorney is trying to communicate is we do have our first time trigger, which is April 12th. All this right. also allows that, us to go forward and bring options forward to the city council. Now, we are still updating uh, and receiving updated uh, allocation numbers from SCAG. So we know that we have this legal obligation for 126 units per the settlement agreement. This also will help with our obligations that are being handed to us by the state. So this will allow us to consider this plan in the context of our housing element as well. So from my perspective, I don't see any harm from the council allowing these two simple starting uh, points to move forward at this point in time. I recognize there are still plenty of questions around this issue and I think we all recognize that we're no longer in a position uh, to build projects like we used to with our redevelopment agency. Uh, but that's not the only alternative that we have available to us. So this is more of a starting point for us and it'll also at the same time allow us to start the process, start the project by clearing the site. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so with that, and that's, is, is everybody okay with us passing this? I think we have to. Well, we have to. We have to, have to, we have to, just Charlie, we have to take a we have to take a vote. But I think that as Isaiah was saying, this fulfills two obligations. It fulfills the obligation regarding the settlement agreement and also for new housing that the state is requiring. I, I understand that. The only thing that I brought up to start this whole thing was: is this just an open end situation? And evidently, that has been answered. Also, it is. So if everybody's in agreement, I understand what Isaiah is saying, what Steve is saying. All of our questions are good questions. And if you want, then I will read a motion if everybody wants me to do that. Dana? Charlie, I just have one question. Go ahead, Richard. Once we get past this April 12th date, is what's the next trigger to us? That's it. There is no trigger. That's, mm -hmm. my, that's my point. It's just there's, out there's there. nothing required mm -hmm. going forward. No, no, no. In, in our and what we can do too in our next general plan um, update that we send to the state, we'll list this. At, well, no, this is where we have a plan right now, which can change for 126 units that we're not only obligated to replace under housing authority law, but it's going to it's going to contribute to the inventory of affordable housing that we're required to not not build ourselves, but cause to be built. So basically, so, what we're doing Isaiah, thank is you for bringing an that intent, up. Richard. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's and Steve, what we're doing is an intent to proceed, like Isaiah is saying, right. what you're trying to tell us. Yeah, we, That's Richard, correct. you okay with that? Yeah. What I'd like to see is whatever the motion is, I'd like to see if Steve and Isaiah are in agreement on the language, but them postulated for us. And if they agree on the language, then we can adopt that as our motion rather than juggling around looking for the right words. Yeah, I actually have the motion language in there. 
That's the right. right. yeah. yeah, that's why the recommendation is pretty lengthy. So, so we're we talking page nine one recommendation as you um, want it read. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, sure. um, yeah. you know, and, the, and I discussed it with planning too. Yeah. The, the, you know, this is um, the, the language is uh, Steve's area. I have no objection to the language that uh, Steve has has put in. Um, you know, these 126 units are minor in comparison to the 800 units, 1800 units we're going to be required to plan for through the RENA allocation. So yeah. this is a component, this is, is, is an important component, and this is the starting point. Uh, but it's also talking about the city's obligation um, beyond a settlement agreement. The numbers coming from the state, you know, are estimated at 1800. And so this plan will be able to be incorporated with a much larger plan that the city's gonna be required to have certified by the state via its housing <coughs> element. And this is, allows us to get forward and uh, bring uh, options forward to the council with how we are going to not only accomplish these 126 units, but also the much larger picture of, uh, you know, how do we uh, get our housing element certified via the state. Okay. Are yeah, we I all just, I just that? Oh, Steve, I just, would you? One last oh. um, you know, I had hoped we were going to be at this point that somebody would come forward and say, oh, Section 19, perfect place. Because that was the idea of bringing in the infrastructure there, of having higher density um, zoning there. So we waited and <laughs> waited and waited, and nothing, nothing materialized from that. So this is like, yeah, this is all we have right now. We didn't get the interest from the private sector that we had hoped for, that we had planned for. Right, and that's what Section 19 was. That's what that's Section 19 was all about. But it's still there. It's yeah, still, it's still there. Well, the economy changes, that'll change. And somebody may come forward, and then we may say, oh, so actually, that's a better alternative. Let's switch over to that plan. You put housing there, you've taken the best remaining income producing land we have and dumped it there you go all right is everybody okay for me to make this motion we're all in agreement now, let we're there be a pause after you say the motion let there be a pause i want to hear steve and isaiah say that works for them okay oh. i will end it that way well, here i go that the City Council and Housing Authority Board direct that the City slash Housing Authority retain the ownership of the former Rachel um, Mobile Home Park property and formally adopt an official former Rancho, Rancho Palms Mobile Home Park replacement housing plan that reserves the former Rancho Palms Mobile Home Park property as a location for the development and construction of a minimum of 126 affordable family dwelling units for moderate low income and very low income families and to direct staff to immediately issue the requisition building permit which includes demolition permits, grading permits and other ministerial permits to commence construction of the 126 affordable family dwelling units for moderate low income and very low income families. Dana, you want to finish it? No, 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 I want them to finish it. All right, you guys, what do you want me to say, Dana? I just want, I, oh. if, if you're at the point of period where you've said everything, you think it has to be covered, then I'd like to hear our city manager and our city attorney say that language works for me uh as or yeah, that's the best language is the correct language something like that yeah that's the language i propose and recommend yeah all right steve you, you want to say yes. it so we got it official <laughs> i think you you he, read it he, he just did i think he, he did, did everybody it. good he, he did that and as isaiah, isaiah is isaiah does it work for you as well yeah sorry uh yes that works that is, right, is there a second I'll make that second. 
All right, let's take a vote, Chris. We have a motion and a second. Christy, will you Christy. please take the vote? Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Christy. Okay. Mr. Mayor, is there any chance we can take a three minute break before we go on to item number 11? Four minutes is okay. <laughs> Even five is okay. good. And okay. Steve, th Steve, thank you for all your input. Really oh, appreciate it. Grilling you. Sorry. Okay. No, no, I expect that. That's good. Those are good questions. We, we, yes. will, okay. we will take a four thank minute you. recess. Uh, can we? I'd like to get us back into session. I'm back. Iris I'm back. is back. Uh, we're all here. We have a quorum. Uh, I would say that uh, we've done what we came to do in the yes. main And uh, now we should adjourn to close session. We have so, one more item. We, oh, we got one more, Dana. One more item. There is one more? Yeah. yeah. 11. Item number item 11. Number 11. Oh, okay, we go, go to item number 11. Is Isaiah? Yeah, there's Isaiah. Uh, Th thank, you, okay. Mr. thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, we will now move on, uh, since we've already done item number 10 on our, our agenda, we will move on to item number 11. This is the COVID-19 state of emergency update and related actions. And Gabe Cotting, our director of marketing, will handle this report. Thank you, Mr. Hagerman, Mr. Mayor. Council, uh, we're here with two specific action items and recommendations uh, today. Typically, uh, the first meeting of the month, we will extend the face covering order that matches the state of California's order. But since we didn't have a meeting on March 4th, our city manager and director of emergency services extended that on, uh, on your behalf. And so we're asking that uh, you would ratify that decision today and then also extend it to the next meeting, which would be April 1st, at which time we will present um, a further extension at the April 1st meeting. And then also to take any action that you deem necessary. So before we make those motions, want to just give you a little bit of an update on some of the city programs. Uh, our no cost COVID testing continues at the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. As you know, we started that on December 1st. Uh, we continue to uh, test on average 150 to 200 per day. And in speaking with our, uh, the curative folks yesterday, we're, the, we're still the number two performing site uh, in all of Riverside County on behalf of curative. Yeah. Not in all testing sites, but ones that curative manage, manages and administers. So to date, we've tested over 34,500 uh, hmm. tests since December 1st, and we're still continue to be uh, open there five days a week drive through service. We did shut down a couple days for the wind uh, last week, but otherwise that continues to go. And then our Great Plates program, which started on May 8th. It's hard to believe we we're almost a uh, couple, month and a half away from that being, program being going on, gone, going on a year. To date, uh, through, to, through uh, today, we've, we have, we've had about 370 plus participants. We've delivered two doors, over 263,000 meals. Wow. And uh, total funds to Rancho Mirage locally owned restaurants is a uh, 5.7 million in counting. Mm. And uh, sure. this program was extended on March 8th to April 7th. So we still have a couple more weeks and that number is going to eclipse 6 million by the time the date, the April 7th date goes. So that continues to go strong. And as we've confirmed the last couple meetings, is that uh, FEMA has, uh, has announced that they're going to be covering 100% of the 100% of that program. So saving the city uh, about 360,000 of what their commitment was on the reimbursement rate. When do um, we get the money? <laughs> well, that's, that's still that's still pending. We haven't gotten our first reimbursement back, but we, we yeah. continue to pepper FEMA every week. Uh, so Jessica and Kofi and the finance team, we all of our paperwork's been in order and reimbursement Paperwork's been in order, but uh, FEMA's not a uh, not a quick payer. Um, and those are the programs that can, that uh, that continue there. And then there's also the details from our small grant, small business grant, 
Um, and there's a total of about 385,000 that went out. Uh, we are in, uh, we j yesterday we moved into, on St. Patrick's Day, we moved on into uh, the red tier, which allowed uh, indoor dining at 25% or capping at 100 people. So our restaurants and businesses are starting to be more optimistic about what's happening. So with that, I'm here with any questions regarding the face covering orders or anything else COVID related. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, any questions? Before we move to the council, we'll go ahead and open up the uh, public comment on this item. So if any member of the public wishes to, to speak on this item, now is the time to do so. If you are participating remotely, you would hit the raise hand button on Zoom. If you're on the telephone, you would hit star nine to make a public comment at this time. Before we go to our remote audience, is there anyone here in person that would like to make a comment on this item? Seeing no one here in person uh, that wishes to comment, we will go to our remote audience. Seeing no one on our remote audience that has indicated that they wish to speak, we will close the public comment on this item and I'll turn it over to the council. Thank you. Um, does anybody have a motion to make or comments made? Either way. You know, yeah. Dana. I'll make a motion. Uh, well, I'll make a comment first. Because, um, you know, as, as Steve Q said, we don't often go around patting ourselves on the back uh, for certain things. And most people don't are not even aware of some of the things that we do. But when you look at these numbers and when you look at these programs that we've offered with the Great Plates program, uh, over $5 million uh, total funds to local restaurants and with our small business grants, with 54 businesses able to obtain $385,000 spread among them. I think it's pretty remarkable. And I think people, especially in, in light of this pandemic and the, the, the financial uh, nightmares that so many people have been going through, uh, I think that we once in a while we can really do a good job patting ourselves on the back uh, because of the foresight we've had and the willingness that we uh, take on to uh, take chances to better our community and help our businesses survive and help our seniors with food problems uh, that they might not even be able to have obtained food with, uh, especially healthy food, with the pandemic and people being locked down. So I thank you, Steve, for mentioning it, but I think it's nice to once in a while make the public more aware of how how much we uh, are compassionate and how much we are aware of the good things we can do for our entire community. And that's Thank it. So Thank, nice. you. Thank you, Iris. Any other comments? Okay, question you. for you on the loans that are being made. Are those any kind of required uh, um, amounts to either labor or food or is it uh, just open-ended? Yeah, you're talking about the small business grants? Yes. Yeah, those were not a loan. That was a grant. And those did have those were those had um, they had to attest to how those were going to be used, whether it was payroll, whether it was improvements. A lot of them were geared towards uh, moving their business to an online platform and enhancing their online um, offerings. Um, so it had it had uh, certain um, restrictions on how those funds could be used. And, okay. and each business had to had to fill an application and attest that they would use those funds and they have to report back how those funds are being used and that's kept on file here with us. Good. Thank you. Any other questions you can give? No? Okay, can uh, we have a motion uh, yes. with respect to, I guess, it looks like two issues. So should we take item A first? Uh, you can take I think, them both I, at I the same I think we time. can do them both together. Well, except if you have a yes and no. Let's, okay, let's, let's take a chance and just do it. Um, All right. I'll make a motion to ratify the March 4, 2021 face covering order issued by the city manager, director of emergency services, extending the face coverings, coverings order be worn in accordance with the November 16, 2020 guidance for the use of face coverings issued by the California Department of Public Health through March 18, 2021. And B, extend the order from the city manager, director 
of Emergency Services of the City of Rancho Mirage, requiring face coverings to be worn in accordance with the November 16, 2020, guidance for the use of face coverings issued by the California Department of Public Health through April 1, 2021, and C, take any action deemed necessary. Michelle, we'll go. All right, we have a motion and a second. Christy, will you please take the vote? Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Do we have anything else on our agenda before we adjourn to closed session? Uh, just for the city attorney to summarize closed session. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the city council at this point is in recess into closed session regarding two existing litigation items. That's pursuant to government code section 54956.9D1. And that involves the cases of vacation rental owners and neighbors of Rancho Mirage et al. versus City of Rancho Mirage and the Save Rancho Mirage versus City of Rancho Mirage case. Those are the only two cases we'll be discussing in closed session. So I'll see you all in closed session. Do we close down or just continue now, Steve? Uh, uh, Isaiah, I, I think Isaiah has uh, sent us closed session. Yeah, so um, Zoom. whatever Isaiah wants. Uh, so we'll what, what we'll do is the members of the public um, can stay on this link. It stays active. And the council has a separate private link for closed session. So from okay. a council perspective, you will actually leave this meeting and go into a separate one. And the public uh, can stay on this uh, link and we come out and report any reportable actions. Okay, so we're leaving and coming back. And when I, I with this finger, I get into a lot of trouble, guys. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit leave. Leave, leave. yeah, push the little leave button there. We yeah. to adjourn leave. this meeting. So, so the council will recess into closed session. Yes, adjourn to the council meet and close session. Okay, it is uh, 5.50 p.m. and uh, there were no reportable actions taken in closed session by the city council. This meeting is adjourned.